Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to this month's hearing uh, for the Parks Committee for the New York City Council. I am happy to see that so many people care about our urban forests. That's really uh, very, very uh, thrilling to me. And um, full disclosure, I do live literally around the corner uh, from the for one of the forever wild sections of Cunningham Park, and you can't get to my house pretty much without passing by that from either direction. So uh, it's really uh, inspiring to see so many people here today. But I really shouldn't be surprised because when um, the horticulture, uh, I guess, conference was held at NYU earlier this year, we had about 300 people there. And so as, as my mother might have said, who knew? Who knew that, you know, who knew? So I'm going to read an opening statement. And we have a lot of people that uh, want to testify today. If you do wish to testify, um, please sign in with the sergeant in arms. We will get to everybody. Uh, I will be here as long as it takes, which uh, will be a few hours, I expect. Uh, we have been joined thus far by three of my colleagues uh, in the order I believe they showed up. Uh, Councilman King, Andy King from the great borough of the Bronx where I was born. Uh, also from the borough of the Bronx, uh, uh, also another great part of our city, Riverdale and that, those associated areas, uh, Councilman Cohn. And from the far western stretches of the Great Borough of Queens, uh, Councilman Jimmy Van Bramer, who I will be with tomorrow visiting a New York City park, the new uh, Hunters Point Park. So I'm very excited about that. All right. You know I'm Barry Grenenchik, and you know I'm the chair of the City Council's Committee on Parks and Recreation. Um, and I do welcome you to our hearing today on examining how we can protect and preserve the city's natural areas, otherwise known as our urban forest. While many New Yorkers are aware of the approximately 30,000 acres of our expansive park system, I'm sure that many would be surprised to know that we have over 10,000 acres of natural areas, specific for specifically forests and wetlands that are located in every borough of the supposed quote-unquote concrete jungle. For example, less than one mile from one of the world's busiest airports, JFK International, lies more than 300 species of birds and fish protected from development in the Jamaica Bay Wildlife Ref Refuge. It's the only national wildlife refuge accessible by subway. I urge you to get there if you haven't been there. But like other natural areas in the city, it contains a vast amount of bi biodiversity with all of the benefits that forests and wetlands have to offer our environment. From places such as Pelham Bay Park in the Bronx to the Fresh Creek Nature Preserve in Brooklyn to Inwell, Inwood Hill Park in Manhattan to Alley Pond Park in my part of Queens, and the Evergreen Park Preserve in Staten Island, it turns out that biodiversity is not and never has been an alien concept to New York City. So we have to ensure that it remains a vibrant and well cared for part of the fabric of our city. These natural areas, like any ecosystem, face numerous threats to their well-being, including illegal recreation, invasive species infestation, and harm resulting from the effects of climate change. Our Parks Department has long recognized the importance of preserving the vast acreage of the city ecosystem and its Natural Resources Group Division is composed of biologists, natural resource managers, and restoration ecologists who develop and implement management programs for the protection, acquisition, and restoration of the city's natural resources. Complementing this division is the Natural Areas Conservancy, which was established in 2012 and operates citywide, conducting research and preservation of the ecosystem all over the park system as its major focus. The re recent focus of the Conservancy and the Parks Department has been on developing a long-term plan to preserve the city's natural areas. Uh, I met with you earlier this year. I seem to run into the Assistant Commissioner uh, just about everywhere. Uh, she's all over New York City. The plan known as the Forest Management Framework for New York City is essentially a 25-year roadmap for how the city can invest in and protect the approximately 7,300 acres of forested area. It was developed over the last six years as teams from the Conservancy collected and analyzed data from all over the urban forest to inform the plan. The framework includes strategies to care for the city's natural areas, such as site cleaning, invasive plant rem removal, revegetating sites, engagement and outreach events to educate the public on the importance of the city's natural areas. And I have to say, I've witnessed the work firsthand uh, over time in Alley Pond Park in the northern part of the alley, uh, just immediately south of Northern Boulevard. 
And it really is amazing. I mean, it's just absolutely, um, it's become a new urban forest. So uh, I look forward to going back this winter so I can walk maybe as opposed to, I don't have a machete, so. And I, wouldn't, I, I would never machete the city parkland. I want to make that clear. The first deputy commissioner is here, so I want to make that clear. Um, the ultimate goal behind these efforts is to develop more concrete metrics for deciding whether an urban, an area of parkland is healthy or not and what efforts should be taken to further its preservation. In addition to examining this plan, there are additional aspects of natural areas preservation that I hope to address specifically today. Uh, whether we're providing enough resources from a staff and funding point of view to take care of these areas, uh, we're not, I can tell you right now, but I'm gonna hear from all of you and you're gonna tell me what we need to do. Uh, illegal recreation activity or other improper acts sometimes occurs in these lands. It seems that park rangers and PEP officers have a role to play here, so we, we're gonna look at that and look at beefing up their numbers to make sure that the rules and best practices are enforced. Uh, number two, how can we improve public access to these areas while ensuring that they remain preserved and unspoiled? Um, many New Yorkers are simply unaware of the vast benefits that natural areas have to offer, even that they exist within the city limits, and it is possible for the two to coincide, that recreation, and a prime example of that is the mountain biking track in Cunningham Park, uh, just a few blocks from my district office where on the weekends hundreds of people uh, gather from the tri-state area. We should also look closely to examine ways that turn, uh, to turn that perception around and develop an infrastructure to accommodate greater public enjoyment of our lands. And three, how do we continue the tradition of having the city at the forefront of research and innovation? We will see today that many efforts are being undertaken to care for and understand our city's natural environments. These research efforts should be encouraged as much as possible with support from the public and private sectors so that the health and well-being of our natural areas remain a priority in the long term. I look forward to finding answers to some of those questions at today's hearings and examining what other possibilities are out there to help our ecosystem thrive. I would like to start by welcoming the administration to protest, uh, protest, present its testimony, there's a Freudian slip, to prote present its testimony on this issue. Uh, again, I wanna thank you all for being here today uh, we have been joined by two more of my colleagues, Mark Jonai, who has the largest park in the city of New York, Pelham Bay Park in his district, Thank and you. Peter, and I well, don't know about that, but we, you're going to get me in trouble here, Jonai, and Peter Koo, who represents um, uh, downtown Flushing and the surrounding communities and uh, has the great Casino Park in his district, among other parks. So with that, um, uh, the first people to testify today are uh, Assistant Commissioner Jennifer Greenfeld uh, from New York City Department of Parks and Recreation, uh, Sarah Charlop, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Powers also uh, with the Natural Areas Conservancy with New York City Parks, and as always, he's not sitting up there though, mm. back seat, Matt Drury, if you could identify yourself though, we have another person sitting there. Okay, okay, slideshow Murphy. Okay, um, <laughs> with that, I'm gonna ask the council to uh, swear you in. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee today? I, I do. Thank you. I do. I don't know if that'll work. Can you turn it around? It doesn't work. All right, uh, Commissioner, please begin. All right, thank you. Um, Maybe you saw my testimony already because basically that testimony, what you know, sort of your opening remarks I did not. kind of covers. I was things, a little late so. today because the <laughs> train, they were doing work, they were well. working on the railroad, so it was a little later than I wanted to get here, but yeah, well, I'm going to listen to you, you and then you talk. You did an okay? excellent job. So, good morning, Chair Gredenchik and members of the Parks and Recreation Committee. I'm Jennifer Greenfeld, the Assistant Commissioner for Forestry, Horticulture, and Natural Resources in New York City Department of Parks and Recreation. Thank you for inviting me to testify today regarding Parks' uh, Parks Department's natural forests. At New York City Parks, our mission is to offer resilient and sustainable parks, public spaces, and recreational amenities for present and future generations. New York City Parks is a steward of approximately 30,000 acres of land, 14% of New York City, including more than 5,000 individual properties ranging in size and variety from Coney Island Beach and Central Park to Pelham Bay Park, Alibon Park, to community gardens and neighborhood pocket parks. The Forestry, Horticulture, and Natural Resources Division 
builds on the park's mission by pledging to protect, restore, expand, and manage New York City's green spaces and natural areas to maximize their benefits for environmental and for community health and resilience. When I tell people that my job is caring for and protecting nature in New York City, one of the first responses I get is a question. Nature in New York City? You mean Central Park. Uh, so I have to remind them that there are many more opportunities to enjoy nature right here in New York City, many more than some would realize. Roughly 10,000 acres, one third of our park's portfolio consists of natural areas spread over 50 parks, including 2,000 acres of salt marshes and freshwater wetlands, 1,444 acres of grassland, 60 miles of streams, and over 6 million trees. Of these trees, over 650,000 grow along the street, 150,000 grow in the actively used areas of parks, but the vast remainder are located in our 7,300 acres of natural area forests. In fact, forested natural areas alone cover one quarter of city park land. So it's much easier, it's much easier to show you the parks than just to talk about them. So I'll take you on a brief tour from the north in the Bronx. Uh, this is a, a beautiful photo of, the, of Van Cortlandt Park, one of our healthiest forests. Um, here's Bronx River Forest. Uh, when people think about the Bronx River, they think about the river. But one reason that the river can um, be healthy is because it's buffered by uh, forests on the edge. Pelham Bay Park, we already mentioned, the largest park in the city. Um, here's the more the northern area of Pelham Bay Park, um, which really looks like and is a part of uh, the north, the New England Rocky Coastline. Inwood Hill Park, of course, you can get there on the A train, a spring scene in Cunningham Park. Uh, and then in Staten Island, Arden Heights Woods, uh, Blue Heron Park, and the most southern part of uh, New York State, in fact, is Conference House Park. Uh, Wolf's Pond Park, and I think you missed, I didn't mention Marine Park, but it was in there. Um, so, uh, so it's hard to be able to describe the beauty of the forest, but hopefully you got a little taste. Um, so while these areas may not be as well known or as crowded as properties such as Central Park, natural areas still play a vital role in providing recreation and wellness opportunities within our city. According to a study in 2014 by our partners at the Natural Areas Conser Conservancy and the U.S. Forest Service that examined how people felt about and used nature in, in uh, parks, in New York City parks, 50% of people interviewed said that the only natural space that they visit is in city parks. This tells, tells us um, that people notice and care for these spaces. They seek refuge, they walk their dogs, they look for birds, they get exercise, or just wander in the woods to find a quiet corner. We also learned that while 53% of the people surveyed visiting a natural area are local, living nearby that park, the rest of them travel over a distance, a distance of over a mile to experience the unique attributes of each site. So these forests offer exceptional recreational and educational opportunities, filter the air of our, ch our children breathe, provide shade and temperature regulation, help protect homes from storm surges, and offer respite from the noise and pace of New York City for all our residents and visitors. As climate change impacts our region, and as the city's population grows, the benefits nature provides to our residents and visitors becomes even more important. We also need to acknowledge the critical role our forests and wetlands play in the regional <coughs> ecosystem. Because of the city's location at the confluence of salt and freshwater bodies, spanning both New England's rocky coast and the mid-Atlantic coastal plain, our natural areas are home to over 400 species of wildlife, including these adorable black-crowned night heron chicks, <laughs> chipmunks, salamanders, baby terrapin turtles, and the newly discovered leopard frog. Over a quarter of these species have a state, federal, or global designation as rare, threatened, or endangered. And of the 1,420 species of native plants found in our natural areas, including globe flat sedge and golden aster, one-fifth of these plants are similarly protected. I have the privilege of overseeing the division of New York City Parks that carefully plans for these resources, selects appropriate species, and manages over $381 million worth of expense and capital contracts. 
We play a vital role as technical experts to review plans to ensure that new projects don't further fragment our remaining natural areas so we can maintain their ecological integrity and be benefits for future generations. We manage two nurseries, one of which is internationally known for its plant conservation work in Staten Island, collecting seeds region-wide to grow native plants for restoration projects throughout the city. Through the Urban Field Station, we partner with the U.S. Forest Service to attract researchers from around the country to study New York City's nature, improving the quality and impact of our work. Forests play a ro vital role in connecting New Yorkers of all age ages to the natural world. And we are working to connect New Yorkers to their city by marking and mapping nature trails and leading volunteer stewardship activities throughout the year. In fact, the council, several council members, including Chair Grudenchik, provided uh, some of our first capital funding to improve trails in uh, three different parks around the city. Our stewardship team held 140 volunteer events in natural areas last fiscal year, engaging over 3,500 New Yorkers. While helping us to maintain these valuable resources, these events are also critical to provide a chance for local residents to actively engage in the care of their city and to have fun and get a workout while doing it. In addition, New York City's Public Programs Division houses the much beloved Rangers, who provide New Yorkers of all ages with educational tours and recreational experiences in our natural areas, ranging from bird walks to canoe trips to night hikes. This programming provides a fantastic way for the public to connect or reconnect with the great outdoors, right here in New York City. For over 30 years, Parks has actively managed our forests and wetlands. The Natural Resources Group is one of the oldest municipal conservation organizations in the country, founded in 1984. We built a national reputation with our salt marsh restoration in the 1990s in response to the Exxon oil spill in the Arthur Kill. Also in the 1990s, we contributed to the nascent field of urban natural res forest restoration through our work with early private investment in urban forests. Through Plan YC and Million Trees NYC, the city made a major commitment to forest restoration, which allowed us to contribute our knowledge and expertise and make a significant impact citywide. And the de Blasio administration has continued this commitment through the Cool Neighborhoods Program, reflecting a two-year investment of $7.3 million. Our knowledgeable and tireless staff spend every day in all conditions, rain, snow, wind, and heat, remember them outside, removing invasive species, planting native species in forest gaps, and monitoring for new infestations, Sight signs of dumping, fires, and other negative uses. They know these forests well and think very carefully about matching the most appropriate interventions, whether physical, chemical, or biological, to the specific situation and properly manage our finite resources. For larger restoration projects in our natural areas, we use capitally funded contractors, after which our staff then implements long-term management strategies to make sure that the area doesn't revert to its damaged past. To demonstrate our approach in a little bit more detail, I hope you'll allow me to, um, I want to explain how we're managing one relatively new invasive species. This is the Mile of Minute vine. Mile of Minute was first discovered in New York City in 2010 in Pelham Bay Park, appearing after we removed a completely different invasive plant that we were actually targeting. It's an annual herbaceous vine that climbs vegetation to reach the sun, produces prolific and persistent seeds, and is known to grow in excess of six inches per day. So maybe not mile a minute, but six inches per day is pretty a much a lot. Yeah. This invasive species is extremely damaging to newly restored forests as it loves the open, sunny spaces and takes advantages of, advantage of the gaps in tree canopy to quickly overcome young seedlings and new shrubs. So since the initial discovery in 2010, we've actively managed the species across over 200 acres of forest, utilizing over $100,000 in grant funding to specifically target mile a minute and release the mile a minute weevil, a biological control <laughs> for the mile a minute vine. Uh, our team now closely monitors edges and newly restored air open areas for the emergence of the species and has been successful in combating its presence in newly restored areas. So what have we accomplished to date in forests across the five boroughs? 
We've planted 686,000 native trees since, and shrubs since 2007. We've held 562 volunteer events, engaging nearly 17,000 volunteers. We've restored 520 acres. We've made uh, 30 miles of trails more accessible by formalizing them. And the tremendous volume of work has led to a point in time, to today, at which we want to reflect and carefully assess our management strategy for natural areas. The successful management of natural forests starts with gaining a full understanding of what we seek to manage. As you'll hear more about shortly, our colleagues at the Natural Areas Conservancy have helped fill in a major knowledge gap. With two years of field work, they compiled, compiled an unprecedented amount of information, not arcane data, but useful information which profiles our city's forests, quantifying their health and the threats they face. We at NYC Parks have already started shifting our approach and prioritizing our work based on this information. And the resulting forest management framework, which has provided our agency with an invaluable roadmap to guide our strategic decisions and better marshal our resources. I'd now like to introduce my colleague, Sarah Charlotte Powers, the executive director of our nonprofit partner, the Natural Areas Conservancy, to provide more details about these important joint efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, thank you, everyone. As Jennifer mentioned, my name is Sarah Charlotte Powers. I'm the Executive Director of the Natural Areas Conservancy, and I want to start by thanking Chair Credencic and the members of the committee for giving us the opportunity to testify about this important topic today. As um, Assistant Commissioner Greenfeld mentioned, the Natural Areas Conservancy is a nonprofit organization. Thanks, Karen. Um, that was formed in 2012 with the goal of increasing the capacity of New York City Parks and its partners to restore and manage 10,000 acres of forests, grasslands, and wetlands under the agency's, agency's jurisdiction. Following in the footsteps of other successful park conservancies, including the Central Park Conservancy, the Prospect Park Alliance, and the Bronx River Alliance, the Natural Areas Conservancy does not exist to replicate or replace the work of New York City Parks, but rather we raise private funds, hire expert staff, and work to complement and amplify the work of the agency. We commend, sorry, I've, yes, oh, that's great, that makes more sense. Um, we commend, the efforts of the agency and the hardworking team of professionals in the Division of Forestry, Horticulture, and Natural Resources to manage this large and complex resource. However, uh, reali um, uh, realizing the full potential of our city's natural forests for public recreation and environmental benefits will require marshalling the appropriate additional resources. To address this, we worked in partnership with New York City Parks colleagues to develop and release the Forest Management Framework for New York City, which I believe you all have a copy of in front of you. Um, this plan includes a comprehensive look at the condition of our city's natural forests and outlines the investment needed to manage them over the next 25 years. And we hope that the Parks Committee and the Council will support this plan and help to ensure its success. Increased investment in our natural forests will allow us to achieve the following. First, our natural forests comprising one quarter of the city's total public parkland require a comprehensive strategic management and the appropriate resources both for New York City Parks and for its partners. Second, we feel that developing a citywide trail system will allow people, many in low and moderate income neighborhoods, new forms of valuable recreation uh, and opportunities for physical well-being. Improved opportunities for the enjoyment of nature contribute to our collective mental and emotional well-being. Next, in the next 25 years, we will be living in a hotter and drier city with higher sea levels. New York City's forests are critical to mitigating the local effects of climate change, ex including extreme heat, capturing stormwater to reduce flooding and absorbing greenhouse gases, and they should be considered an important part of our city's climate solution. 
And lastly, New York City's forests are at a tipping point. They need sustained strategic investment or they will decline in quality. This will ensure that we do not find our forests in a crisis that creates costly and generational backlogs of work. Our forests are at risk of losing biodiversity that, once lost, can never be regained. The participation of many groups in this hearing and the increased number of volunteers and users of natural areas indicate a growing and vocal constituency for this vital New York City resource. So when we were formed back in 2012, the first thing that we endeavored was to better understand where and in what condition our city's natural um, areas were. So in order for this plan to be successful, we first needed an in-depth in -depth information about our city's natural resources. As a first step, we hired a team of 25 expert researchers and conducted a comprehensive ecological assessment of all 10,000 acres of forests and wetlands. This created a baseline of information about the condition of nature in New York City. We also partnered with our colleagues at the US Forest Service who are with us today to conduct a companion social assessment to understand how our city's natural areas are perceived and used by residents of our city. This extensive research is the basis for the forest management framework and other data-driven management tools that we have created. Following the successful Million Trees campaign, the NAC identified the need to plan what came next and to address a much larger area of New York City's forests. As Jennifer mentioned, the Million Trees campaign touched about 500 of our 7,000 acres. We conducted an in-depth study of the condition of forests and the, surprise, the findings were very surprising. First, our forests are very diverse and dominated by native trees and our big, intact, mature forests are very similar in their composition to places like the Catskills. But our next generation is much less healthy. Our understory is only about 45% native and our young forests are threatened by fast-growing invasive vines, including myeliminate, um, dumping, and unauthorized trails. Maybe the next one. Um, most of the trees occurring in our natural areas are actually not planted, which is sort of a fun fact and um, kind of flips a little bit upside down. The idea of tree planting is the primary goal of managing forests. In fact, the majority of these trees are naturally occurring. They grow from seeds um, and that is a sign of great health. It's much less expensive than planting, but it's not a completely self-sustaining system. It does require some management in order for those um, forest systems to continue to thrive. Our research also found that natural forests are an important resource for New Yorkers. Spending time in nature provides significant cognitive and emotional benefits. Our city's natural areas offer an opportunity for New Yorkers to have a wilderness experience that includes access to beauty, inspiration, and quiet that is unique from the other experiences in our parks. However, interviews with more than 1,600 park users show that people are more likely to recreate in natural areas that are well-maintained. This includes well-marked trails, regular patrolling by rangers, and enforcement officers, clear signage, and healthy forests. In addition to being an important resource for New York City residents for recreation, our natural forests are increasingly important in the face of climate change. Um, this is a stat that came out last year and really surprised me and I think has been gaining a lot of traction nationally. Um, across the U.S., extreme heat kills more people each year than hurricanes, flooding, and storms combined. Our natural forests are one of the most effective methods for reducing local temperatures and they also absorb carbon, providing a double benefit as a local climate solution. The framework includes a citywide model that maps the condition of forests in more than 50 parks. It also allows us to understand the full range of conditions that exist across New York City and to estimate the investment needed in order to restore and manage all 7,300 acres over the long term. I'm just gonna take a moment actually on that last slide to say this is really significant. We, until this data set existed, never had the ability to plan for the entire forest across the whole city at the same time to really think about the, in, 
range of conditions across all five boroughs, and then to estimate the total investment needed to do this work. That cost calculator, which we developed, also works at a park scale or even the scale of an individual project. So it's a real game changer to be able to use science to understand what the condition is of the place and then to have a financial model that lets us know what the investment is needed in order to restore those places. Um, the NAC led the development and promotion of the framework and New York City Parks has adopted the recommendations and is using the framework to prioritize and track their work. The framework calls for a significant, significant investment over the long-term period, an estimated $385 million over 25 years. But we believe these costs are relatively modest considering the critical impact that this investment will make. We need to invest now. Um, so we can move to the next one. The framework is both a financial planning tool and a new approach to prioritizing where and how to work. NYC Parks is using the framework today. It's also allowing us to evaluate the effectiveness of our restoration efforts and to inform what species to plant. The NAC is working to continue research and expanding public access and creating alignment between the work of nonprofit partners and park conservancies, all with the goal of restoring and protecting nature through sound science. So we're very much interested in expanding overall support, but we're not waiting to sort of hit the ground running. Um, that was that last slide. So, um, so ma making nature accessible. We're striving to ensure that every New Yorker has access, not just to a park, but to a place where they can connect with wild nature. New York City's population is on the rise, and this is leading to crowding in many of our flagship parks, including Central Park. Congestion in parks can be relieved by the restoration and improvement of the city's natural forests, which, which occupy one quarter of the city's parkland. So I want to also describe, it might be a little bit hard to see, but this is a before and after of the trail system in Marine Park in Brooklyn. The agency has mapped over 350 miles of trails, and if you see the image on the top, this is what the that trail... Three, is that 350 citywide or just a Marine? Okay. A 350 park. citywide. Okay. Um, yeah. But you can see it's a very convoluted, sort of hard to navigate, um, kind of squiggle of trails across that landscape. No signage at the trailheads, no marking on the trails once you're out in the woods to know where to go, and no accurate trail map to allow visitors to navigate. So although residents of this neighborhood live adjacent to a large forest, it's very inaccessible and hard to navigate. The um, approach that we've been piloting is closing off a lot of the excess redundant trails through planting and seeding, leaving communities with a better quality trail system, working with local youth to provide job training opportunities, and simultaneously restoring the forests themselves, which we view as a real win-win for everyone. Um, pursuing the goal of effective and uniform forest management citywide, the NAC provides support to nonprofit conservancy partners, including helping them to prioritize their natural resource projects and allow them to align their efforts with those of the agency. In 2018, we provided pro bono consulting to the Prospect Park Alliance and the Forest um, Park Trust to develop five-year management goals for each park. This included creating a list of priority projects and cost estimates for those projects. These organizations are using those recommendations to prioritize where to deploy their existing resources, but also to fundraise for new investment in their forests. And we are seeking support to expand this approach to more than a dozen additional partners. Um, so protecting and promoting New York City's nature cannot be done alone. New York City parks, despite its size and reach, just can't do it all. And the NAC also cannot work alone. And our partner conservancies and local groups also benefit from working together. So New York City Nature Goals 2050 is an initiative that was initially spearheaded by the NAC um, to develop shared goals and targets for New York City's many environmental groups, both large and small, to increase our coordination and advocacy for New York City nature. This coalition brings a powerful voice to plan, 
and advocate for the future of New York City's nature. And if we go to the next slide, it's hard to read here, happy to distribute it after. More than 60 agencies, um, nonprofit organizations, and academic institutions have participated in the network to date, and it's now being co-led by a team of partners that are working together. And I just wanna say, I think part of the reason this room is so full today is the um, sort of foundation that that process has laid for all of us to work together. So thank you to all of the partners who have joined today. Next slide. Investing in our natural areas is an idea whose time has come. This administration has the opportunity to continue to be a leader in this emerging topic. Together, we can make New York City more resilient, protect our natural history and incredible biodiversity, and provide our children and each other with access to inspiration and to beauty right here in our own backyards. As we hope today's testimony has demonstrated, the Forestry, Horticulture, and Natural Resource Division at New York City Parks, in partnership with the Natural Areas Conservancy, is committed to protecting, restoring, expanding, and managing the New York City's natural areas. And the council's support and leadership is vital to our efforts. And just a note, while these photos are breathtaking, nothing can substitute a uh, walk in the woods when you experience the fresh smells of the trees and the quiet in the air. You have a standing offer to join me and my expert staff at any time of the year to visit these beautiful spaces. Thank you for this opportunity to share our work with you, which is a vital part of Parks' mission and service to New Yorkers, as well as for your continued advocacy for our city parks. We will both now be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Um, it's nice to see a large crowd, as I said, uh, for a good cause this time. Uh, we're all good causes here, though, so um, a lot of happy faces. Let's see smiles out there. Um, so my first question, I have questions coming uh, from Councilman Cohn, Councilman Jonai, and Councilman Ulrich. We have been joined uh, by Councilman uh, members uh, Costa Costantanides of uh, Western Queens. Uh, from Southern Queens, Councilman Eric Ulrich, and from the far southern reaches of the borough of Brooklyn, uh, where it takes him a long time to get here, uh, Mr. Justin Brannon, our friend from Southern Brooklyn. So, a um, lot of money, huh? Not really a lot. You know, what's $385 million between friends? Um, can you explain to me how that money would be used and um, would, would most of it be up front? Do you need more up front? Do you need? Do you want to start? Uh, uh, okay. So the, um, the full breakdown for the proposed budget is actually in the back of the frameworks that you have. It includes an annual breakdown okay. and also a breakdown between capital and expense funding. It's worth noting that- Can um, you tell me the approximate breakdown of capital and expense percentage-wise? Anybody out there? I don't actually Somebody have a copy got that of number? It's roughly half it's and half. It's roughly half and half, and this is not, you know, starting. Thank you from zero. There is obviously an existing um, commitment by the agency to this topic, so those numbers are sort of all in numbers, and they're a build on what we. So of the are 385 providing. million, do you know how much has been committed already? Well, we. You have said 384 million it would make everybody stay, but <laughs> I hope it's going to be back. <laughs> Well, this just came out, uh, and um, we are, uh, Mayor de Blasio added funding through the Cool Neighborhoods um, program, so it's seven, a little bit more than $7 million over two years that goes through FY20, and so that's pretty much the, the level that we're looking at for capital investments for the first few years, builds a little bit from them, so for now we have those two years of funding, and we do have uh, staff, uh, the existing staff is sort of, as Sarah was saying, is part of this plan. We could talk about those numbers offline, just trying sure. to get mm -hmm. a sense of uh, what is necessary. Um, you know, the, the more I learn about the Parks Department, the more I realize how little I know, because it's such a vast, um, and complicated agency, and uh, it, it, everybody loves their parks. Um, we love our forests, and but it's important to understand what we're getting into and the investments that we are making here. 
Um, who would do the work, uh, the restoration, the all the things that you mentioned today? Is that done by Parks Department employees? Is it done by contractors? A mix of both? How would that work? A mix of both. A mix of both. Just as we do now. Assuming that um, the Parks Department, the Parks Chair in 20 years from now, or somebody, whoever he or she may be, um, what will, what would we be looking forward to when we get near to the end of this um, idea that we should restore, and I, I believe we should, this is very important um, to New York City. Uh, many of the neighborhoods that I represent are forever wild forests, and I know that's true in a lot of the different council districts uh, throughout the city, uh, especially in uh, stretches of the Bronx and Staten Island. And so what might we be looking at when we're completed? I mean, I just like trying to get a little glimpse into the future. Sure. I think you've seen the, the future in some of these places, you know, like you're saying in Alley Pond Park or um, some of the places that we've been restoring in Pelham Bay Park. I mean, it's just a question of taking our success and making sure we're covering in all, all the ground and that, we, that it doesn't revert um, back to where it was. And um, uh, so it's going to be a beautiful multi-storied forest that you can sort of see through and see different things in different seasons. There'll be trails that will be clearly marked, accessible. Um, there'll be um, a, sort of an engaged and motivated public uh, to support this work. And, uh, and you'll see um, uh, um, regeneration of the forest occurring primarily on its own, although there's always some management that's going to be needed. Okay. I'm going to um, defer right now to my colleague, uh, Andy Cohn. He's got a, another engagement. So, Mr. Cohn? I really appreciate that, You're Barry. Thank welcome. you very much. Uh, I, I will be brief. I just have a couple of quick questions. But I, I want to know, that give you, uh, that I had a little heads up that Sarah was going to testify today because her dad told me last night that you were going to testify. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> He's everywhere. That's amazing. Uh, I, 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 uh, I represent uh, uh, the Northwest Bronx, that there's a, a, a significant uh, uh, amount of this kind of property in, in my district, and I think that uh, a good job is done in maintaining it, uh, particularly when people, uh, if you drive along uh, the Henry Hudson Parkway and you go into Westchester County and you see where they're not doing a good job of maintaining it, uh, it's really a very stark contrast. So I, I want to give uh, credit where credit is due. Uh, but I do want to ask about the, the use of pesticides in these, in these areas um, and how it's used, how we determine it's used, how much it's used, and the role it plays. Uh, sure. I mean, we are committed to restoring natural areas and to using, as I said, the best technique that's appropriate for the place, uh, safety, and... Um, uh, safety of our workers and the health of the, our workers and our forests are extremely important to us. Um, that being said, we used many different techniques. We use physical techniques. We, we do use chemicals in the forest, and we use sort of cultural techniques because it's not about what you do. It's also about when you do it, how much you use, and who's trained to do it. Um, if you give me a moment. So in general, we don't use um, chemicals where people can access them. They're further away from most of where people are. Um, it's very limited in it's the smallest amount possible. We're always investigating new techniques and approaches uh, using um, trained, we always have to follow local law, federal law, state law, and, um, and we're looking at all different kinds of alternatives all the time. We recognize that um, there, uh, the public is sensitive to the use of that, and we want to make sure that we can manage our forests in the best way possible and also meet the needs of the public. Uh, if I if I pressed you on it, saying we use it in small amounts, could you quantify? Uh, do you do you know how much you use? How often you use it? If I yeah, we, I, I don't have it in front of I me, but it's publicly reported, and we can help you get that information. So we have to report everything through the Department of Health, the NICEPERS system, um, and we can get that information to you. I, I just want to also acknowledge that uh, 
I see the friends of Van Cortland here who also do a, a, a lot of work in trying to maintain the trail, so I want to acknowledge that. Uh, I have to go, to, but I will try to make it back. Thank you very much, Chair. I appreciate the courtesy. Thank you, Thank you Councilman Cohn. Um, I'm going to continue on with a few more questions, and I'll get to my colleagues uh, relatively quickly. Um, on its face, it would seem to me that a mature forest would, would be less susceptible, but sometimes older things are more susceptible. So um, can you explain a little bit how mature forests fight invasive species better than a younger forest might? Sure. Um, one thing that invasive species love is uh, in open our space. Is Exactly. We all love open space. We love yeah. open space. <laughs> they like sunny open space, so they take advantage of gaps. And uh, a younger forest um, are, if we didn't have so many invasive species, um, the younger forests are sort of very quick growing trees and other you know shrubs and annuals and perennials below them. And um, but they're not fast enough to really shade out the quicker growing invasive species. So the mature forests have enough shade that they essentially shade out the worst of them and they get it to a point where it's much more manageable to maintain. And so that's why you have to have people, wh that's why our staff is always sort of looking in the woods, looking for gaps, trying to fill the gaps, and those mature forests don't have as many gaps. Okay, that makes sense. Um, can you tell me where we might find a newer forest? My forests are kind of old, but I'm just wondering <laughs> where, which is great because I have 100 and 200 year old oak trees in Cunningham Park and in Alley Pond. We have the Queen's Giant in my district, but right. I'm wondering where we might find, I know that in the alley there are restored, so you would consider that a newer forest. Exactly, I would okay. consider that area that you were talking about near Northern Boulevard behind the APEC, behind the Alley Pond Environmental Center to be um, a younger forest or sort of an adolescent forest. That has yeah. grown just unbelievably, really. I mean, I, I don't know if it was just because there's so much water. I was <laughs> there in the spring. I wasn't there, you know, lately. I'll, I'll go back uh, maybe in the next month or so just to take a look yeah. on a walk. But um, do you thin them out? I hate to, to say that, but, I, you know, is that part of your forest management program or you just let it grow? Um, I think part of the goal of this framework is to increase the um, funds available for maintenance after planting and also for sites that are in sort of a medium condition and don't actually need a, a big overhaul. And the kinds of places you're describing are the kinds of places that can utilize that sort of high skill work of in-house staff who can be very, very effective at really kind of nudging things in the right direction without having to do kind of a big overhaul. So there is some maintenance that happens in all past planted sites and that's um, very effective, um, but there's, there's a, a lot of acres that are sort of in that medium condition. But, um, to speak to thinning, we, we haven't done a lot of thinning now um, lately, or really at all. We don't typically thin, um, okay. but it's something we've been thinking about um, with the million. I'm not suggest. I just want. No, no, no I know you're curious. Um, curious. The the with the million trees program, and really our approach has always been get canopy established quickly because that's what's going to keep going to keep out the invasive species. Um, and what we've been learning over time that we can do that probably with fewer trees, and we could probably do that with not just planting trees, but planting shrubs, which would help the canopy, and then in the end, you're not gonna have quite the same sort of competition. But that's what happens in the woods anyway. In uh, um, some of our researchers are here, I don't know the exact number, but when you look at the woods, how many, a thousand s seedlings might be in a little patch of a, of a couple square yards. Um, so over time, that's just going to happen naturally anyway. Okay. It won't need us to do it. Because I, I guess the, the faster growing trees are an advantage to you, to them. You know, an oak kind of grows slower, so some oaks, you know, so. Right. All right. Th there have been different philosophies. Do you plant uh, what would typically go there, uh, come in on its own, which are the sort of the fast colonizing species? They grow fast, they die fast. Or do you put everything, do you do like a, you know, ready-made, um, a plant palette that has everything that you're going to need in the future. And we have been putting in uh, a diversity of species with the different successional stages. Okay. I am, um, I'm going to take a break here. I'm going to ask uh, the first questions 
uh, from my next colleague from Mr. Jonai. Councilman Jonai. Thank you, Chair. So good to see you again, Commissioner. Who enforces the rules in our natural uh, areas? Uh, PEP officers, rangers, any and other enforcement, any enforcement um, So NYPD, so Columbia Park, the largest park in New York City. What is the number of PEP officers and rangers? Yeah, we'll have to get back to you on that. I mean, we certainly I know. safety yeah. is important to us and we, I'll get you the exact numbers. I don't know how many, uh, I know how many rangers are citywide. I think it's, um, I can get that to you in a second. Well, I can answer it for yeah. you. You know. <laughs> not, Go ahead, not, tell me. Not enough. <laughs> no, there are 38 Rangers citywide and nine sergeants, um, but I don't, I don't know right now. But we'll get back to you about that. 38 citywide, nine Rangers. That's not PEP officers. Right. Yeah. So that's Rangers. I don't have the PEP number one. Yeah. It's certainly not enough, and I know that, uh, and it's evident in the activities that partake that happen in the Pelham Bar Pelham. Bay Park area. What are the some of the illegal activities that are concerning when it comes to these areas? Well, thankfully, uh, our natural areas aren't really the site of significant illegal activities, and certainly nothing different than anywhere else in the park. What we our biggest concern is actually what visitors, how visitors are treating the land. So the types of activity, Ill illegal activity that we find are dumping, arson, off-road biking, and ATVs. And that's what we see. Right. Yeah. Um, the mile a minute vine, how dangerous is this for Pelham Bay Park? Um, I would say we've got it in check. I mean, we're watching it. It's definitely something we have to watch. How many personnel are? Do we have? Yeah. We have, uh, check on this by heart. Hold on one sec. We have uh, 24 staff members on our forest restoration team. And uh, there are other folks who work in some in the conservancies outside of the natural resources group. And uh, we have 33 full-time equivalents working on forest management across our whole division. Right. Uh, Pelham Bay Park. Uh, is it 2,600 acres? 2,700, but who's counting? Yeah, exactly. 26, <laughs> uh, 27, 12. Yeah. With uh, the number of staff in itself is probably not completely adequate to meet the needs of just Pelham Bay Park, let alone citywide. Yeah. Well, I think one great thing about this plan is that it allows us to do, to be really efficient and and do the best job with the resources that we have. That's a creative way of saying we do a lot with the little that we have. Well, we she, she we has do a lot. <laughs> They're here asking for have. $385 million, so they recognize I, that they need more. I am, I'm actually here to tell you, to make sure you know how great the city forests are and to tell you how hard we've been working to take care of them and to get you a little bit more interested in the work we do. How would you rate Palm Bay Park? How would I rate it? Yeah, it's meaning... Very good. Actually, I'll... Does Sarah know offhand how it, how it is on the health and threat matrix? I can say that it actually ranges across the whole park, but that some parts of Pelham Bay Park were in the very best of the best. So one thing that we actually found was that no individual park was uniformly sort of top of the heap, but that we have these pockets of really, really high health, and they tend to be kind of located inside of larger parks. So Pelham Bay in that, in that sort of um, regard is very similar to the rest of our city. It has some really great places and it has some places that could use some additional resources. Uh, resources for, Pel and again, I'm making this all about me, uh, Pelham Bay Park, what resources in particular? You know what, we haven't done a park scale estimate, but we have the ability to do that. I so think that would be great if we can get <laughs> to doing a scale, um, a better understanding of this large park complications in and around it, mm -hmm. having not only a beach and all the other extras mm -hmm. that go with it, but a lot sure. can be learned and perhaps uh, yeah. gained. So I'm supportive of the work that you're doing. I'm looking forward to Great. a commitment from you on doing that sooner than later. I look forward to working together. I'm looking forward to doing so myself. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Councilman Ulrich, please. 
you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to give a shout out first to Portia Danforth and uh, Josephine from Forest Park. They do a <laughs> tremendous job. Uh, last year, we funded, we meaning the council as part of the Parks Equity Initiative, I allocated uh, a big chunk of money to restore the Pine Grove area. I don't know if you're familiar with that project, but that was a project that Josephine and some others in Queens had really advocated for for a number of years, and that's a new sort of uh, planting, if you I don't know how you would term it, but uh, yeah, restoration. restoration, of thank course. Thank you very much. Uh, well, don't thank me. Thank the taxpayers. <laughs> it's their money. <laughs> but uh, then we had to buy some sort of spray to spray the uh, trees so that they wouldn't uh, – the, was that to – we treated them, right? For the beetles, right. That was very expensive. Okay. Oh, for the pine bark beetles. For the, yeah. And then we were going to paint them, not with a brush or anything, but we were going to uh, – we were going to cover them so that people wouldn't take them around Christmas time because they were really just very cute and about four to five feet each, and there were 131 of them. Oh. And we didn't want people going into Forest Park and taking them around Christmas time. But my point is, uh, I'm, I'm bringing up all of, all of these um, truthful and funny anecdotes for a reason. Even after the initial investment, it, it costs a lot of money to maintain some of these restoration projects. And we can't always rely on uh, the taxpayers because we don't know what the future of our city's uh, fiscal health is going to be. I mean, God willing, it will be good and we'll continue to fund these things. But, you know, we know that the economy is a cycle and, God forbid, 10 years from now we enter into a recession. Um, you know, how are we going to maintain uh, the great work that we've done and the investments that we've made? I guess I'm curious to find out how do we leverage public and private money into these projects uh, as elected officials and, of course, um, parks and the advocates. How do we really marry the two in, in terms of a true and real public-private partnership? Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of money in New York City. There's a lot of you know wealth and, and big companies and corporations and – I think that a lot of them would be really interested in like a matching grant program to say, hey, we have this project in Pelham Park or Forest Park or Cunningham Park or give, give me a park in Bay Ridge. You got a Shore Road Park. Shore Road Park, you know, and we, it's going to cost uh, $300,000, but we have 150000 in city money and we'd like you to put up the rest and we'll put your name on a sign somewhere. I mean, like, I, I think there has to be a pl strategic planning for the long run for the bad times. That's that's my concern. Right now we're in the good times is great, but we have to plan for bad times too. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the reasons that the public-private partnership model has been so successful with New York City Parks is that it really has helped to sort of smooth some of those ups and downs in our economy. Um, I guess sort of two points to your question. The first is that by our estimates, over a thousand acres of natural forests in the city are touched by nonprofit conservancies. So part of the work that the NAC is doing is making sure that those private dollars are spent to maximum impact. And we think that's a really great opportunity to align the work of the Natural Resources Group with the work of uh, all of our nonprofit partners and to make sure that we're sharing data, that we're sharing our priorities, that we're working together to really achieve a common goal. Um, there are certainly opportunities to expand that public-private partnership model, but I simultaneously think that natural forests are one of the resources in our city that um, are really valuable public infrastructure, and I think we've seen over the course of decades of public-private partnership that private philanthropy doesn't and shouldn't replace public investment. So finding that balance is very important. And I think it's part of what we are seeking to do in this plan and seeking to do through our partnership with the agency. I want more money for Forest Park. And uh, <laughs> I just want to be very clear and <laughs> upfront. Uh, I'm willing to put in what I'm able to put in. I think I put in almost all of my parks equity initiative just into that project yes. last year fiscal year alone, which was great. I was, it was a wonderful um, project. And also, it, it actually, for those who don't know, 
anything about it. I didn't know anything about it until we started it. It was actually a uh, hundred years ago dedicated as a World War I mm -hmm. memorial for the mm -hmm. uh, people from Richmond and Woodhaven who died I've seen in those World War I. I've seen that. I've seen so, uh, and some of them were destroyed by hurricanes and, and invasive species and other things. So we, re re we replanted and restored uh, those uh, the pine grove, those trees in that area. Mm, right. But I, I didn't realize how expensive just that little patch would be. And there are so many other areas in Forest Park that need a lot of money um, and attention. I only represent the the areas sort of adjacent to it. It's actually located within Councilmember Holden and Kozlowitz's district um, uh, primarily. But I, I fund so much there because my constituents love it, and I love it. Mm -hmm. um, and we've seen a, an uptick in, in Forest Park with the carousel and mm -hmm. some of the ball fields. and. I think, though, to get to your point with the public-private partnerships, sometimes these corporations, they want to fund tennis courts and basketball courts and things that are sort of sexy and athletic, and that's great. <laughs> but when you tell them we need help, you know, with reforestation there, I, I don't know how difficult it is. Maybe it would be easier if we had, like, a development associate with fundraising goals or like a, a real strategic plan to go out and raise private money that we can leverage well, with the public We, we do have 17 conservancies in the city yeah. that raise over a million dollars a year, some of them well into eight figures. So Central uh, Park has Central one. Central Park, the, the, Prospect Park, yes. which have large natural forested right. areas. Um, but I, I don't see a lot of private money going into Forest Park. That's my point. <coughs> and I, I've been in office for nine and a half years. Um, so. I'd be happy for us to schedule a follow-up That would be great. I, that's all... Uh, Chairman, thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilman Ulrich. And uh, now, uh, Councilman Kostantanidis. And thank you for your time today. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Chair Grudenchik, for this great hearing. Uh, I have a few questions. One, I see Astoria Park is a, a very small blip there, but a, a great 60-acre uh, jewel in our community. How is the, the forestry at Astoria Park? I don't think it was um, assessed. There's no natural area, natural area forest in Astoria Park. Okay, I so see you had a little, yeah, I thought it was, you yeah. had a little on, on your map there. So, <laughs> but I mean, what I'm noticing yeah. uh, is many of the forests in New York City are budding water, yes. and as we are experiencing, as you talked about, climate change and sea level rise and many of these issues, I understand that the importance of these green areas to combating climate change. But what, are the, what is the impact of climate change on these areas? What are we doing to make them more resilient, to protect them from sea level rise that is, in many cases, through different emission models and climate models, possibly going to create air places where we're not going to be able to, we're going to see a lot more serious flooding. A hearing earlier this week showed 50 inches of sea level rise by 2080. So what are we doing to protect these natural spaces from uh, sea level rise and climate change in the future? Um. I think I'll yes, yes. NAC has been working on a climate adapted species program, so I'll let them explain it, which we've adopted. Okay. Yeah, so I, I'll um, start by saying that actually a third of our natural forests in the city are in flood zone A, so it's mm -hmm. a significant portion of the total resource. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, we created a tool to select species that are. Um, predicted to do well in future climate scenarios in New York City, and the agency and NAC and um, increasingly partners are utilizing that as a way to select species for new restoration projects that we think are more st sort of sturdy um, and more likely to thrive in you know this in the future, um, and that includes thinking about some salt tolerance as part of the selection process. And another, uh, I'll just mention that a classic way of combating any sort of change is to have diversity. So you want to have a diversity of species, mm -hmm. you want to have um, locally adapted species, and we, in particular, I mentioned the um, nursery that we manage in uh, Staten Island, which when we plant actually collects seeds from local species. So you have a very broad diversity of both genes and species to allow us to adapt as things change. So the, the, the $385 million this report talks about, is, is that some of that money have that, that resiliency efforts baked into that or? Yeah, it would be. That includes plant material and the plant material would be selected to maximize adaption to future climate scenarios, so yes. 
Okay. And, and, and the other question I'll have is, you know, I, I don't represent that area, but we just passed a number of bills that were related to Jamaica Bay. And what is the role um, that New York City Forestry and uh, has on those natural spaces there, at all, if at all? Um, and I know that the National Park Service has a large role to play there, but what are we doing around Jamaica Bay, which is another area that's uh, in a flood zone that, that has been impacted by climate change and could potentially be impacted even more? Sure. Um, Jamaica Bay is very important to us. As you know, Every all the property that is on the inside of the Bell Parkway is, is New York City parks, and so mm -hmm. we have a lot of the parkland around the tributaries to Jamaica Bay. So people definitely think about the National Park Service and the Marsh Islands, but Fresh Creek, Spring Creek, um, Marine Park, Idlewild Park, they're all New York City parkland, and they're part of our plan to manage natural areas for us. And we've actively worked on particular particularly salt marsh restoration around there. It's not a forest, uh, but um, we're working the Army Corps of Engineers on a salt marsh restoration in Spring Creek, and they're all designed to um, to reflect uh, potential, the, the climate change and sea level rise. Uh, so are those in need of additional funding as well, or? No, nope, not right now. Oh, no. okay. Well, so that, that, th those. Uh, that's good to hear. Yeah, the, Spring first, right? yes. <laughs> the Spring Creek is fully funded, and uh, uh, some of the other projects are are, are very long term, so they're not really a, they're either um, Army Corps projects. They're on, on a really long time horizon. Not to cut into my colleague's time because he, I didn't put a clock on him, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> but um, do you have baked into this proposal uh, wetlands, both salt water and freshwater wetlands? Is that mm. part of it? No, it's okay. not part of this plan, but we but uh, come back to us in about a year, and maybe we'll ask you for a chance to tell you about our wetlands um, uh, management framework because we're in the middle of putting it together. I've learned you're not shy, so <laughs> I'm not worried about that. Um, Tasta? Uh, I, I would be. I, you, you went exactly where I was going okay. to go next as we were talking about wetlands, so uh, that sounds very interesting. And as environmental chair and partnering with my great colleague, uh, uh, Chair Godenchik, we'd be. I'm looking forward to hearing that report because I know that what the role the wetlands play in, in our ecosystems and, and protecting us from sea level and, and flooding. So I'd be happy to, to hear more about that when you have the opportunity. Great, great. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Councilman Costantanidis. Uh, I'm going to try to get through these quickly so we can hear from uh, the people who've been patiently waiting. Uh, did you find any surprises in certain areas of the city where you thought maybe things would be worse or better or, you know, is there any? I mean, I think we were surprised by how great so many places were. I, I think the overall finding was a just much, much healthier set of resources than we anticipated. So, I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's it was a I think we all knew that there were really great space. We know that there are great forests in New York City, but what was a surprise to see kind of like the, to see the numbers and the statistics, which helps illustrate the, the success of the work we've been doing for the last 35 years. Um, but we, but so when we saw that 85% native uh, uh, canopy um, species number, we were, we were like, yes, that's what we were hoping, that's what we kind of felt, but it was nice to be um, reassured by the numbers. So we've been talking about the forest today, and we're going to continue to talk about them, but within the forest reside many different animals and, um, you know, insects that um, New Yorkers mostly enjoy. Um, including raccoons and coyotes and squirrels and chipmunks and uh, many different kinds of amphibians. But in your plan, do you, does that work? Do you plan certain trees to encourage animals uh, to reside in our forests? Uh, I, I mean, we consider wildlife as part of the forest. Trees are just one piece of it. Um, you can't have one without the other. And by focusing on native plants, and particularly not thinking just about the trees, but about the shrubs and the wildflowers and other, other layers of the forest, then we are essentially inviting in native um, wildlife, which is beneficial for everybody. Okay. Um, can you give me a little bit about the, the structure of the, uh, the Natural Areas Conservancy and how it might differ in form and function from other conservancies that uh, run and maintain parks. Like we know we have the Central Park Conservancy and we have mm -hmm. Prospect Park and others, but how are you different uh, from those? 
Because you don't have a specific park that you worry about. Yep, that's right. So we are similar in that we are a nonprofit. We raise our own funds and we have autonomy over the projects that we select and work on. Um, the geographic areas that we work in are really aligned with the places where the Parks Department's Natural Resources Group works. So you're doing some of what Councilman Ulrich kind of hinted at. Well, he didn't hint at it. He said, you know. We have done some private fundraising for individual restoration projects. Um, that hasn't been the core of our focus. Uh, we've been very focused on conducting research, creating tools and plans, and developing the kinds of recommendations that are in this framework. But we do each year raise private funds and do a handful of in the field restoration projects in parks across can you, the city. Can you tell me what your budget is a year, approximately? Mm -hmm. It's about $2 million a year. And is that more from foundations and corporations or more from individuals? Um, the majority of funding comes from foundations. We do get both individual um, donations and some corporate support, but the bulk of our budget comes from foundation support. Uh, Commissioner, the invasive species that are, are invading our forests and our parks, are there this many? Is it you know a handful <laughs> of really persistent ones, or is it do we have like ten that are really bad, or fifty that? It, m more like lot. the ten that are really bad, okay. or really like the four or five that are really bad. Do we train volunteers to look for that? How do you find these things? I mean, because it's a lot of forest, the seven thousand yeah. acres plus. We have a great volunteer program. Our stewardship group. Um, has different, takes different approaches. So we do sort of the drop-in idea where we offer a program and people can come and drop in as an individual. We schedule um, programs with individual groups who are looking for outings. But one of, I think, our most promising program is our super stewards program where people have to, they really commit to taking care of a particular geography, a particular place on a regular basis. And we invest a lot of time in them. We have, you have to have gone to an event first, then there's a workshop, then we meet you on site and we teach you what to do. And those folks are amazing. And they also themselves run volunteer programs. So they'll go out, organize their friends and neighbors. Do they have ID them. so that if a PEP officer yes. comes, right? So, <laughs> yeah, they so have they're something. authorized then yeah. to remove invasive species from New York City parks? Specific ones in specific places. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. That's great. Um, I won't ask you what the most, is there a most common, is there a worst offender? We should, we, should we have a 10 most wanted list? I mean, <laughs> we could easily do that, a five most wanted. Porcelain berry, maybe? I'm looking at my, at my uh, natural areas manager over there. Porcelain berry, huh? Yeah, I would Sounds say porcelain nice. berry. I know. Maybe we should maybe. rename it. it. Yeah, it looks nice, but it's not, it's not good. It's a woody vine that can literally weigh down a tree and tear down a tree. So it's particularly okay. difficult okay. once it gets large. Porcelain berry. I think yeah. I know what it is, but I'm not 100% like certain. Favorite one to hate. Um, how many people currently working in the Natural Resources Group? Yeah, I just said that. I think it's uh, oh, in the entire Natural Resources Group, um, we have 73 baseline positions. Uh, 59 are city funded, and 14 are IFA funded. And then we have additional, about 30 people who are funded by grants or other external funding. Like um, the stewardship program has several folks who are, a number of people who are funded through NYC service, for example. And has that increased recently? Has it stayed the same or how it, are we doing? It's actually increased recently, okay. which has been um, great. We had some temporary lines that were funded through the Croton Mitigation Grant, for example, that were baseline in FY16, and that helped specifically Dan Cortland Park, Pelham Bay Park. Um, and we also recently received, I think about a year ago, eight new city lines, eight new lines for us. I mean, that is it's a fantastic. Lot. A lot. I um, take them in my office, but I, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> they conduct um, mandated compliance and monitoring, so we can really follow up on um, a lot of our work. So it's been great for the last few years. And I know that, I mean, just in my district alone, I have you know 500 acres, according to what you and that was pretty much what I estimated looking at my maps. And um, do have you been to every corner of every? I mean, it's a big, it's a big city, and um, I have been to about 70 parks since I become chair. And I know how many there are. There are 1,800 or so. But 
I, I, I don't expect that you've been to every square I inch. Have not. <laughs> not you, not you personally, yeah. but uh, the Natural Resources Group or the Conservancy has. Oh, absolutely. Okay. We have covered everything, particularly during the ecological assessment. And you see 25 people out there over two summers, um, plots everywhere. And our staff is regularly in, in I wouldn't say every single um, square foot every year, but we are everywhere. We get to So them all. once we identify more funding, we'll be able to, there won't be a, won't be a lag if, if this funding it becomes available, more of it, then we would be able to tackle these problems immediately. You'd be able to set people out, hire we contractors, hire additional staff. We would never say no. Okay, I didn't think you would, but <laughs> I had to ask. Um, we have, as I mentioned before, a, a great example of urban forest uh, coexisting with uh, the mountain bikers who are from uh, concerned Long Island mountain bikers climb. Uh, they work very closely with Queens Parks, and uh, it's really been great. Uh, they maintain the trail. They're very they're fastidious. I, I have seen them uh, in action. Uh, they do educational events. So ha have you um, other opportunities like that, developed other opportunities in other parts of the city? Uh, I mean, we work with mountain bikers in, all, in every place. Where I've we have seen three it. I, I know there's a trail trails. in um, Prospect one. Park. Uh, one is official and one is not so official. <laughs> There's definitely one <laughs> official Commissioner in uh, Mar. Okay. Wolf's well, Pond, maybe, is that right? Maybe it would, and, maybe I got uh, my, and Wolf's Pond has one? Wolf's Pond and Highbridge, they okay. both have official uh, mountain biking trails. Maybe the one in Prospect Park is not as welcome. <laughs> and I, I <laughs> so we work with them. We, lo we work with any constituents who are interested in sort of branching out. Are there other examples other than mountain biking that we have? I mean, obviously... There's very passive recreation, just walking through the forest mm -hmm. and you know maybe reading a book on a rock or something like that. But I'm just wondering if they're outside of mountain biking. Right, birders, I would uh, well, say, yes, is a course. pretty yeah, significant constituency. And then you have other runners, um, marathon, yeah. you know, other long distance runners. Certainly, they're a huge constituency in Van Cortlandt Park. There's also um, a couple of parks where groups like the New York New Jersey Trail Conference have mm -hmm. a direct partnership with the local park administrator and are helping with the public access side of things. Okay. We've actually also, we recently did um, a study looking at, um, I'm going to get this wrong, so I apologize, looking at Bram, the um, uh, uh, religious groups who uh, often make offerings into the, into the sea. And we've been talking to them, and they, they've actually taken an interest in doing stewardship and cleanups mm -hmm. around these areas. Uh, so definitely look at who, you know, you want to start with who uses it and actually recognizes rec recognizes the importance of the of the area. So we're definitely being very creative in who we engage. Yeah, I've seen, uh, you know, I, I in my district, Alley Pond, I think the, the forest there is more heavily used. Uh, with the exception of Cunningham Park, where the mountain biking is, but the other parts of Cunningham um, still fighting the after effect of Sandy and those trails that, you know, I know they've been working, to, most of them are reopened. Mm -hmm. um, they're narrower, though. The trails in, um, in Alley Pond tend to be wider and uh, better maintained. So we're working, though, and we're trying to provide some more money for that. Um, any areas that you close off, and, and how long would, would that be? I know that. I've seen that in Alley Pond where, cla where trails have been closed off to allow for uh, regrowth or regeneration of the forest. How long do they typically, and I know you don't like, you know, the bushwhacking, you want people to stay on trails because, um, is that illegal in a New York City park? No. You, to, it is not illegal. You can walk anywhere, oh, right? Yeah, you I can mean, walk that, anywhere. Yeah, okay. Sorry, it's not legal to bushwhack. It's right. not illegal to, to remove any vegetation. No, I, no, I don't mean, no, I mean, when I say bushwhack, I mean just walking off a, a trail. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I understand you're not allowed to, you know, remove anything. Right. Except train people with invasive species, so. Um, all right, I just wanted to ask that question. We've asked who uh, enforces rules. Um, is there one type of illegal activity or several types that are worse or they're more commonplace? Like illegal campfires probably are up there. And I mean, I, yeah, I would say arson has a, a, has a most immediate and um, impact. You can see it, but it has also has a long-term effect because you have to manage what's left afterwards. But probably I would say it's like off-road bicycles might be worse. Okay. And then there's dumping. I mean, they, they're all 
Yeah, you know, I, I see it all the time, and, and unfortunately in my neighborhoods, and we had a really bad problem with tires. It was wacky. Um, over 1,200 were dumped on a short period of time um, on several different occasions, but we did a news conference, and uh, since then, thankfully not, and it was all in parks. It was all in, um, I think all of it was along the Clearview, and all of it happened to be in Cunningham Park, and the people that, I think that DOT was angrier because they, they came out to remove the tires, um, <laughs> but they were not happy, so that yeah. seems to be a, a problem, but fortunately not as bad as the, the bad old days I when, when cars were driven in, and we all remember that, those of us who were old enough, I'm looking around, most of the uh, people who would remember that are no, here today. No, we definitely come a long way, and that's one of the first things Energy did was to understand that you had to secure, so to speak, the borders from the negative uses, not the positive uses. And once you do that, then it, you actually have a chance of restoring it. I actually found a number of years ago an old car in oh, yeah. Cunningham, and um, I gave him the site, and then Phil Sparaccio, one of the deputy chiefs, he called me, he said, we can't find this thing. It was rusted to the color of leaves, so <laughs> unless you were right on top of it, um, but they got rid of it. They were very, very, they they, oh yeah, they, I, I assume they cut it up somehow, um, you know, but it's gone. So that's, uh, that's all good. We don't have those kind of issues uh, in New York City parks. Um, have you acquired more parks? I know Commissioner Silver has been here uh, several times this year. Mostly about budget, but he was a uh, little, little brogadashio uh, talking about um, we're over 30,000 acres now. Was that, right. um, so have you added new forest to, I know it's not easy to find forest in New York City, well, but. Well, um, I mean, Udall's Cove, I think, okay, was, yes. the, uh, was a recent acquisition. And Brookfield, the, the property that pushed us over, has natural areas okay. in it. Yeah. Okay. Um, my last question for you. Um, do you know what percentage of people who use New York, so let's, I won't ask percentage, but do we know how many people use our forests every year? You can I know um, there are 130 yeah. million park visitors, according to the commissioner, and I would say that's probably, you know, getting some shaking of the head over here. <laughs> it's, yeah. But no, I, I think it might even be higher than that. The uh, social assessment that was conducted by the U.S. Forest Service um, interviewed people in over 40 parks and a little over 60 percent of the people who were interviewed reported spending time in natural areas. Okay. So it's significant. It's, it's probably significant. in the millions. Yeah, I mean, I based upon my, um, my informal surveys, but, um, and that includes a lot of school children that get taken to, you know, environmental centers and then they go mm -hmm. out like in the alley and, um, right. and range so that's of all, all, all good. Um, all right, I think I'm done with my questions for you. I would ask that, uh, as always, that somebody stick around or somebody stick around so you can hear um, what very interested parties here. I really want to thank everybody for uh, being here today, and uh, we're going to get to we're going to get to some um, advocates, and then we'll get back to government. So um, I'm going to call you up, and I'm going to put you on a clock, but I'm going to be a little more expansive today. Uh, so, Lynn Kelly, New Yorkers for Parks, uh, Adriana Espinoza from the New York League of Conservation Voters, Josephine Scalia from the Forest Park Trust, and Portia I, uh, Dierenforth, did I get that right? It's unusual, huh? Thank you. Still not going. After we hear from this panel, um, next up uh, will be Patty Rafferty from the National Park Service and Richard Hallett from the USDA Forest Service.
to go? Uh, I'm waiting. I don't know. I, I think we're almost good to go. I'm, I'm ready, but I don't know if. Um, okay. It's not your phone. Okay. Yeah. Miss uh, Kelly, please. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you to the committee. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lynn Kelly, Executive Director of New Yorkers for Parks. I think you've heard a full description, a robust description of how important our natural areas are to us in New York City. Um, they provide us with a view of our city that predates um, our dense urban environment. It really is how New York City began. And for us, we feel it represents a vital ecological buffer against some of the worst impacts of climate change. Um, as such, we are 100% behind the framework and ask that the city and the city council consider funding uh, the implementation of this framework as put forth by NAC and the NRG group at Parks. This 25-year funding plan, um, which yes, has a scary big price tag of $385 million, but I want to put this into perspective. I was going to ask you to raise the money, but go ahead. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if you average that out over 25 years, it's a little over $15 million a year. And this weekend when we are in our apartments listening to the wind and the rain from the first of the fall, winter, nor'easters battle our apartments in our city, I would say that there's probably an interesting analysis to be done of the costs of what it costs New York City to clean up after all of these storms. In aggregate, I would say, I hasten a guess that over a 25 year period, uh, if climate change continues in the unfortunate way that it has been, we're going to be faced with much larger nor'easters, much bigger storms, and much bigger cleanup and bills associated with that. So I would ask the council that as you sit down with your colleagues in the budget and negotiations team, uh, Councilmember Constantinides on the environmental impacts of climate change, that you consider that $15 million a year is a very small investment for maintaining and protecting and restoring our natural areas uh, in comparison to the ecological protections that they provide. Um, I will add that we believe also that the protective maintenance of these trails is an equity mandate for New York City, which is something that we haven't spoken about today. To give you an example, um, for residents of Cypress Hills and Highland Park in uh, Brooklyn's District 37, Highland Park itself represents the only sizable open space in that area, in that neighborhood, and in that council district. Um, and if the natural forests in Highland Park aren't kept clean, safe, well-maintained, it's a barrier to public use. It's, it's essentially a barrier to that community's access to open space and cuts off that neighborhood, much in the way you said access to where you live is supported by the park in your area and the maintenance of the park in that area. So we do consider this an equity issue as well. Um, so the committee knows New Yorkers for Parks repeatedly called on the city, uh, the administration and the city council to fund these important initiatives. Um, and what's really critical here is the funding of this project, that there are adequate staff lines um, to implement this forest management framework. And we would hope that in this immediate budget cycle, um, that those staff lines are not lost in the administration uh, as they put forth their budget for the city. Because if we lose the initial staff lines that we have today, that will only impede us from implementing the longer forest uh, management that we have a plan for. I thank you. It's my intention to not only make sure they're not lost, but to add funding to the parks budget for uh, FY20. That will be my hope and my desire. And I'm counting on a lot of people in this room to help me make that a possibility. I do want to introduce the new budget analyst for the committee. As many of you know, Ken Grace has moved over to the other side of City Hall. Uh, but we are lucky to have a new budget analyst, Monica Bujak. Uh, i got to get used to pronouncing that name. Um, and she is a recent graduate uh, from Columbia University. Does they have, do they have a forest there? Probably a little one. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Adriana Espinosa. I'm the director of the New York City program at the New York League of Conservation Voters. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Councilmember uh, Krenchik for this opportunity to testify here before the Committee on Parks. Uh, New York City has over 77,000 acres of green space, it, making New York City approximately 41% green. Um, nearly 10% of this space is in the jurisdiction of New York City parks, uh, where there are over 5 million trees made up of hundreds of species in our natural forest. Uh, and New York LCV considers forests one of our city's most valuable environmental assets. 
with uh, enormous public benefits. They mitigate climate change, provide clean air, contribute to the well-being of residents. And just to illustrate that briefly, uh, a tr tree cover can cool down a city by two to eight degrees Celsius. When planted near buildings, trees can cut air conditioning use by 30% and reduce heating energy use by 20 to 50%. And a single large mature tree can absorb 331 pounds of carbon dioxide in a year and filter some harmful um, airborne pollutants. Um, in total, New York City trees remove 1,300 tons of pollutants from the atmosphere each year. Um, and so they're also very valuable to our city's economy. The New York City Department of Parks and Recreation measured the economic impact of its trees to be $120 million a year. And each year, uh, the canopy captures 1.97 billion gallons of stormwater runoff and stores 1.2 million tons of carbon per year. However, our natural forest is at a critical juncture. Without concerted efforts across the board, it can be challenging to preserve and protect our urban forestry. Um, our forests are also under threat as a result of lock, lack of proper maintenance, Ill illegal dumping, and invasive species that we heard a lot about earlier. Um, it's, it's investment is needed now to ensure that we don't find our forests in a crisis. Pushing this investment down the road only guarantees that it will cost exponentially more and create a generations long backlog of work. Just like other critical city infrastructure, it's imperative that our forests are kept in a state of good repair. To achieve, achieve this, the city should invest 800, $385 million over 25 years for the ongoing restoration, conservation, and management of our forests. In New York City, the Natural Areas Conservancy is on the forefront of researching our urban forests. This April, um, NAC and New York City Parks released their forage ma forest management framework the 25-year roadmap and funding plan for the management of our forests. It is the first ever comprehensive plan for this critical natural resource and is the result of years of data-driven and science-based research. NYLCV strongly supports uh, NIC's efforts to restore and preserve our forests and we urge the city to implement the forest management framework for New York City. We also believe this framework should be adopted as part of the city's one NYC plan as its benefits contribute to the plan's existing goals of sustainability, resiliency, and equity. Implementation of the forest management framework is a top priority for NYLCV and will continue to be a major focus of our advocacy in the coming years. I'd like to thank uh, Chair Grudinchik and the Committee on Parks for their attention to this issue and I look forward to working with you all uh, moving forward to ensure that New York City has a healthy and thriving forest for generations to come. Thank Ms. Espinoza, in your second paragraph, you cite 77,701 acres. I assume that includes state and federal lands? Yes, that's total. Okay, okay. That's total. Right. We're a little baffled here, but now we know. Thank you. We're always thinking of city parkland, but we know that there's a lot of parkland uh, that is not um, necessarily city land. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, this testimony is on behalf of the Forest Park Trust. I'm here with Josephine Scalia, the landscape manager for Forest Park. Um, we would like to thank... Um, you are. Would you just identify yourself for the record? Certainly. Portia Dierenforth. I'm the administrator for Forest Park and Highland Park in Queens and Brooklyn, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Forest Park Trust. Um, the Forest Park Trust is a nonprofit organization founded in 1998. We partner with New York City Parks and the community to support, maintain, and program forest and highland parks. You often hear about the ecological importance of healthy urban forests, but what about their effects on our citizens? From Richard Liu's Last Child in the Woods, researchers believe that the loss of natural habitat or the disconnection from nature has enormous implications for human health and child development. An individual's connection to nature can improve their interpersonal relationships and emotional well-being. In Forest Park, we have 274 acres of forever wild natural areas to connect to. 64% of our patrons use our natural areas compared to 57% citywide. Visitors are attracted to the park's numerous amenities such as the 1901 carousel and the golf course. However, our identity is in the majestic towering oaks, tulip and hickory trees in our beautiful forest. We have some photos that uh, up until the 1990s, our natural areas were plagued with illegal dumping, an unmanaged trail system, erosion, and illegal activities. We also had a plethora of invasive exotic plants creating monocultures and inhibiting native plant regeneration. For the last 20 years, with Josephine and the Forest Park Trust partnering with New York City Parks, 
half a million dollars was procured in grants and council discretionary funding to work on these issues. These funds supported summer staff, research, management guides, and maintenance supplies. We have treated over 100 acres of forest, created a hiking trail system, planted 16,000 native trees and shrubs, and mobilized over 5,000 volunteers. Permanent staff and funds are needed to keep our forest healthy. Only consistent year-round management is effective in reducing invasive plants and encouraging native plant regeneration. Without treatment, areas can turn into overgrown vine lands, compromising the health of mature native trees. Council member Eric Ulrich, who's here earlier, uh, immediately saw the value of Forest Park's natural areas. Over the last six years with discretionary funds, he helped support a summer forest crew and most recently, he funded the restoration, as he spoke about, of the historic pine grove. With this allocation, we are able to save this deteriorating forest, restoring and preserving it for future generations to come. It really is breathtaking. Um, working with the Forest Management Framework Program, we have learned that Forest Park is at definitely at the tipping point on the forest health scale. The trust fully agrees with the NAC assessment and recommendations, and we are confident the forest forestry framework protocol will preserve and sustain and improve our forest for citizens experience the full benefit connected to the forest in their own backyard we urge you to support the framework thank you thank you very much thank you all for your testimony um, obviously you know where I believe and I I'm, I'm happy to see so many people that are here today and I'm going to uh, dismiss this panel we're going to hear from our next panel uh, Patty Rafferty from the National Park Service. Richard Hallett from the U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture Forest Service. And uh, just to mix things up a little, uh, Eric Sanderson from the Wildlife Conservation Society. And Jason Smith from the New York Restoration Project. Thank you very much. Ladies first. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Patty Rafferty, Chief of Research Director at Berkeley National Restoration Project. Once more. Good afternoon. I'm Patty Rafferty, Chief of Resource Stewardship at Gateway National Recreation Area, one of 417 units of the United States Department of Interior's <laughs> National Park System. Gateway encompasses more than 26,000 acres of recreational lands, woodlands, wetlands, and other significant natural and cultural areas. In New York City, Gateway includes the Jamaica Bay and Staten Island units. Jamaica Bay is well known as an estuary that provides important habitat for finfish, shellfish, crabs, and other marine species. Perhaps less well known are the Jamaica Bay uplands and coastal forests that provide critical foraging and nesting habitat for migrating species of birds along the Atlantic Flyway. To date, within the Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge, NPS has recorded 331 of the approximately 700 species of birds that occur within the North American continent. These forested uplands are an integral component of the habitat diversity within the estuary. Our Staten Island unit contains a, contains a remnant swamp white oak forest at Miller Field as well as substantial forested and scrub shrub plant communities at Great Hill. The total area of the maritime coastal forest within Gateway's Jamaica Bay and Staten Island units is approximately 3,500 acres, or 50% of our combined upland habitat in those two units. New York City Department of Parks and Recreation and the Natural Areas Conservancy are critical partners that have worked with Gateway for restoration and management of forested habitats. The Million Trees Program has been extremely valuable to to the National Park Service and served as a catalyst for the restoration of degraded woodlands within Gateway. Through interagency collaboration, common stewardship goals, and combined expertise, New York City Parks, the Natural Areas Conservancy, and NPS have developed forest restoration projects that total about 30 acres at Floyd Bennett Field and Canarsie Pier in Brooklyn, Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge in Queens, and Crooks Point in Staten Island. We view the overall goals of restoring, sustaining, and connecting woodlands 
is critical to supporting the ecological integrity of Gateway's vegetative communities. Sustainable forest habitat are among our highest priorities to support diverse native wildlife and provide visitor enjoyment. In addition to the ecological values, forests provide important ecosystem services. Our forests provide an oasis for retreat from the hustle and bustle of the city and an opportunity to engage and observe nature. Forest also provides oxygen, sequesters carbon, and reduces local and regional temperatures. While our forests contribute to human health and wellness, the health of our forest is at risk. In 2016, the Natural Areas Conservancy assessed 1,495 acres of grassland and woodland within Gateway at Floyd Bennett Field in Fort Tilden. This study mirrored the work that NAC previously completed on 10,000 acres of city parkland. At the NPS site, 75% of the sample plots contained invasive vines and dumping was found in 69% of the plots. Two of the five most common understory species were invasive. The non-native tree of heaven was one of the five most abundant trees within these plots. Information from this assessment is crucial for science-based management of gateways forest. More recently, the Natural Areas Conservancy and NYC Parks Forest Management fra Framework provides strategic and comprehensive planning for conservation and management. NPS supports the vision presented in the plan as well as the implementation of the plan to improve and protect the city's forest. Investment in forest management is an investment in the well-being of the city's residents. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you for being here today, and it's great to know that you work with our park service. We don't normally think of national parks in New York City, um, but they certainly are here, and they're a very important part of our park system. Um, next up from the Department of Agriculture. Thank you. My name is Richard Hallett. I'm a research ecologist with the U.S. Forest Service. I'm testifying on behalf of the USDA Forest Service and our research scientists at the New York City Urban Field Station. We'd like to acknowledge the critical work that New York City Parks and the Natural Areas Conservancy do on behalf of the city's natural areas and our communities. The USDA Forest Service is a multifaceted agency that manages and protects 154 national forests. Today, as the U.S. population is over 80% urban, we find that urban landscapes also need stewardship and restoration. And our calling to care for the land and to serve the people applies just as strongly to urban areas. Over the years, we have worked with the New York City Parks and the NAC to assess the ecological condition and social value of the city's natural forests and to create STUMAP, a citywide stewardship map of all civic groups that are involved in caring for the environment. Our work as Forest Service research scientists builds on a legacy of studying recreational use and forest ecosystem dynamics in our national forests. The natural forests of New York City require different management and care than the city's street and park trees. The city's natural forests are valuable not because of the project products we can extract from them, but for the ecosystem services, including cultural ecosystem services they provide the city. Healthy, well-managed forests provide more and better ecosystem services, are more accessible to visitors, and are more beautiful. New York City's natural forests are an important type of green space providing unique nature benefits within the urban context. Of the estimated 6.9 million trees in New York City, approximately 3.3 million are found in the city's natural forests. Consequently, these forests provide a disproportionate amount of the ecosystem services to the city. In a recent social assessment of natural forests, we found that these are highly social places. For many New Yorkers, their nearby natural forests amounts to the only nature experience. In fact, about 20% of New York City park users interviewed said that they go nowhere else to recreate in the outdoors. The recently released forest management framework is based on a comprehensive ecological assessment of the city's natural forests. We now know that 82% of the mature trees are native, but only half of the young trees that will replace them are native. This suggests a need for intervention to ensure that these forests are not taken over by exotic invasive species. For the first time in its history, New York City has the information to make comprehensive science-based management decisions about its natural forests. This information is just as detailed and rigorous as the information we use to manage our national forests. The forest management framework takes advantage of this new knowledge and outlines a plan that will ensure that the city's natural forests will continue to cool the city, absorb stormwater, reach their potential to absorb greenhouse gases, 
and provide access to nature for the people in the city. We stand committed to continue our co collaboration with the city's natural resource managers, policymakers, researchers, and residents. We look forward to working shoulder to shoulder with our colleagues to improve the health of the city's forested areas as a benefit to the larger ecology of our region and the well-being of local residents. Thank you. Thank you very much for your work, and uh, please thank your colleagues as well. Uh, up next, we have Mr. Sanderson from the Wildlife Conservation Society. Yep. Uh, can you hear me there? I can hear you just fine. Uh, fine. Thank you, Chairman. And thank you to, and to you and to the committee for holding this hearing. Um, my name is Eric Sanderson. I'm a senior scientist at the Wildlife Conservation Society, a board member of the Natural Areas Conservancy, and the author of Mana Hata, Natural History of New York City. Um, I'm also a resident of City Island in the Bronx, commonly go to Pelham Bay Park, so please say hello to Councilman Jonai. I Jonite absolutely will. Next time you see him. Um, so I'm here to I'll make be waiting some outside for me, but go ahead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I won't keep you too long, sir. Um, I'd just like to make a few comments about how the historical ecology of New York City informs our modern efforts to con conserve and manage our forests today. And I have three brief points I want to make. The first is that we think of our forests as being embedded within the city, but in fact, I think a better way to think of it is how the city is embedded in the forest. I yeah. think you're right. Yeah, you know, we you don't have to. You don't have to drive. I was driving out to visit a friend in Pennsylvania last weekend, and you get to the forest very quickly once you leave Manhattan. No, you know, that's right. That's once right. Once you leave New York City, and even in New York City. That's that's right. If if these buildings weren't here, this would be forest again, as the pictures on your on my testimony show you there. Um, you know, the, the soil that's under our feet was created by the forest. The forests were habitat for Native Americans for 8,000 years before the Dutch showed up. Um, they, were, they were the reason the animals were here that actually brought the Dutch here. Um, they created the freshwater streams that allowed people to live here, 66 miles of which on Manhattan, uh, 514 miles that existed formerly citywide. Um, you know, in some ways, forests, as much as the Dutch, you know, chutzpah or 19th century might, have been what made New York City. We wouldn't be New York City if we didn't have our forests. And so I think we owe something back to the forest. Um, so my second point is that, you know, if we were to go back in time to Henry Hudson's arrival in 1609, we'd see that it wasn't just one forest the way we've been talking about today, but actually seven kinds of forests on Manhattan Island, um, perhaps as many as 20, 25 different forest types citywide. And I, I think the way to think about that is, is the same way we think of neighborhoods. You know, in the same way that Tribeca isn't the same as Astoria or Riverdale isn't the same as, as Coney Island, um, these different forests provided different kinds of habitats for plants and animals. Um, each forest had its own cast of characters. Um, it was a unique and indelible part of the landscape we're there. So, you know, as we manage our forests, we need to conserve them with this diversity in mind. Um, and this is the basic idea of ecological representation, which is something that WCS works on all over the world in our conservation efforts. And third and finally, I think, you know, a critical reason that we need to conserve forests in the city is because they're natural examples to us of what strength, di diversity, and resilience mean. Um, they give us clear, locally adapted, inspiring examples to teach upon, teach about, to reflect upon, to give us hope. Uh, forests may or may not make anybody any money, but they do make life worth, in, worth living here in New York City. And um, in fact, these, these are the values that are recognized in the New York City Nature Goals process that Sarah mentioned and that many of my colleagues here today have been working on. Conserving forests hits several of the targets that we've been talking about, managing natural areas, providing safe access to nature, and engaging the city's young and old and learning about and caring for our city. Forests provide value that can be shared for all generations to come for the next 400 years. So let me ask you a question or, or um, the other ecologists who are here today. Yeah. Would it make sense for us to take some of our public lands, not necessarily parkland? I know uh, it's a constant battle in New York City between um, places to live and places to work and places to go to school, but mm -hmm. if we had open lands, would it make sense to reforest some of them as opposed to? In, in my opinion, yes. I mean, I, I think there's two competing forces that are shaping New York City night right now. One is the popularity of the city and how the population is rising. It's risen tremendously. In my lifetime, it's gone from, went down to 7 million and, or so, and now it's back up to at least 8.6 million. That's right. I mean, all, all, the, all the great things about New York City and many of our problems right now, whether it's transit or traffic or 
the affordable housing all relate to just what you're talking about, you know, the attractiveness of our city. But at the same time, the city is facing threats from sea level rise and, and climate change, which is taking land from the city. And one of the best and most resilient ways to deal with this is through restoration of nature in the city. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Smith. Thank you for the uh, opportunity to testify. Thank you. Um, and I, I uh, will reiterate uh, support for the framework that uh, many other speakers have given, um, hopefully useful from the perspective of a nonprofit conservancy with a focus not just on rest restoring our forests and managing them, but programming them and engaging young people in them. Um, uh, MRP. Oh, I should introduce myself. I, guess. I know who you are. <laughs> Jason Smith. I'm the <laughs> director of Northern Manhattan Parks and um, for New York Restoration Project. Um, and we're deeply excited and motivated by the outlined, the vision outlined in the forest management framework. Uh, we hope that the city will do everything within its power to support New York City parks and other practitioners in uh, delivering the steps outlined that will achieve optimal ecological and recreational outcomes for our forests. Um, while the forest management report highlights the remarkable natural resources of our forest, it also acknowledges that there's an impending crisis in the quality of those forests, which will only be compounded by growing threats from climate change and invasive species. <clears throat> and to put it in a bit of a regional context, between 1979 and 2000, the eastern U.S. net loss of forest was greater than uh, 3.7 million hectares, which is an area larger than the state of Maryland. Um, and additional recent research suggests that on average U.S. cities lose about 36 million trees each year because of land use changes and the development pressures we were talking about. And this loss of forest um, it is one of the large drivers is rapid urbanization, which really creates an opportunity for New York City to demonstrate how our forests can be protected and more fully integrated into urban ecosystems. <coughs> In that direction, MRP has been working to restore neglected natural areas in New York since our founding in 1995. Um, that work, we've, we've seen firsthand the transformative impact that a safe and well-managed forest can have on a community. We were very pleased to see NAC and the New York City Parks <coughs> include a social and ecological lens in the framework because we long believed that any approach to land management in New York must center on social and physical resilience. <clears throat> when managed effectively, our forests provide environmental and public health benefits that have been touched on by many of the speakers, including cooling the neighborhood, supporting biodiversity, sequestering carbon, and improving stormwater management. Uh, but really critically, it's become clear to us that a well-managed forest is safer and more inviting, and that creates opportunities for environmental stewardship, education, and recreation, which MRP believes really are the right of every New Yorker in every neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> we see many opportunities for the Conservancy Network to help apply the framework. Um, it's helping us set goals, uh, align our work, and motivate all of us to achieve a collective vision for natural spaces in every neighborhood in New York. Okay. Well, I thank you all for being here today, and thank you for your work. Um, it's very important, and um, very, very happy to see, um, so far, more testimony to come. Everybody <laughs> pulling uh, in the same direction. So um, with that, I'm going to dismiss this panel. And thank you again. And the next panel will be uh, Linda Tower from the Riverside Park Conservancy, uh, Christina Taylor from the Friends of Van Cortland Park, and Margot, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, Perron, of uh, the Van Corlett Park Conservancy. Um, three running, yeah. Ms. Tower, yep. would you um, speak into the microphone? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Better. Um, 
My name is Linda Tower. I'm the Vice President of Operations for the Riverside Park Conservancy. And as you know, Chair Gdenchek, um, as we've been delighted to host you twice uh, in the park since you took home of this committee, we are a non the nonprofit organization that supports Riverside Park, providing about half the annual operating budget. We work alongside New York City Parks Department and community volunteers to maintain nearly 400 acres of waterfront parkland in one of the densest urban environments in the world. Our mission is to help restore, maintain, and improve Riverside Park and parts of Fort Washington Park in partnerships with the city for the benefit and enjoyment of all New Yorkers. We view Riverside Park and all urban green spaces as essential New York City infrastructure. Providing adequate ongoing care helps ensure the ecological and social health of not only our local community, but also the city as a whole. I'm here today to explain our work and how it fits into the larger framework of forest management in New York City. I then have three suggestions for how we can make tangible steps to better support our city's forests. Riverside Park is almost entirely a built environment. Thus, forested areas occurring there face unique pressures. Spanning six miles along the Hudson River waterfront, the 400 acres of parkland contain large sweeps of natural areas and include 60 of the 7,300 acres of forested natural areas in New York City. Our restoration goals focused on establishing essential forest function, such as supporting water quality, adding habitat value, and educating our community to be active stewards of the park. The Conservancy has evaluated the best opportunities for forest and habitat restoration in our park and has created a set of goals that guide our work. One, support water quality of the Hudson River by addressing erosion and strategically planting areas to capture stormwater runoff from city streets and park paths. Two, improve habitat for migratory birds traveling along the Hudson River corridor by creating and sustaining forage and cover at appropriate times of year. Three, increase ecological diversity by controlling and replacing invasive plant species with plant material that can support regional forest health. <coughs> Four, educating and enabling our community to be active stewards of natural areas by providing experiential learning opportunity for people of all ages and backgrounds every year. The Riverside Park Conservancy considers the ongoing restoration and maintenance of Riverside Park's natural areas to be one of the organization's top priorities. To meet these goals, um, we've engaged the Natural Areas Conservancy. Um, we provide dedicated staff and facilitate direct involvement with the community through 40,000 hours of volunteerism each year. And we're always returning to the big picture context of our work. Whoa. It's okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, New York City's forested areas are at a critical tipping point. Um, constantly threatened by invasive plants, garbage dumping, and pollution, there are hundreds of underutilized, neglected areas that should be improved and utilized to create valuable connections between fragmented habitats and neighborhood neighborhoods. There is great potential for these spaces to function as an interconnected network of natural habitats that will support one another in vital ways. Riverside Park's 60 acres is just a piece of the puzzle. There are tangible social benefits revol resulting from equitable, safe access to forested areas for passive recreation. We strongly support the Natural Areas Conservancy's Forest Management Framework for New York City released this year, which concludes that time spent in natural areas improves cognitive and emotional well-being, reduces crime, and fortifies social cohesion. As noted in the report, 25% of New York City's parkland is natural areas and insufficiently managed due to lack of funding. Year after year, the New York City Parks Department bud operating budget is less than one half of 1% of the city's total annual budget. This is insufficient to protect our parks and natural areas. With greater support, many unmanaged areas could be transformed into functioning habitat and valuable public oases, fostering a more sustainable, equitable, and ultimately resilient city. I conclude by asking um, our local government to first recognize our forests for assen the essential functions that they provide to New York City while understanding that they are not self-perpetuating systems. Given the harsh urban conditions they exist in, compounded by the reality of climate change, urban forests need to be reconceptualized as a crucial investment in terms of both 21st century infrastructure and public health. Second, in order to provide the long-term preservation desired, the city needs to provide ongoing support for organizations positioned to provide long-term stewardship of restored forests. And third, 
the third necessary step for the City Council is to take to is to actively prioritize implementation of the Natural Areas Conservancy's framework by providing funding and additional outreach support for New York City Parks and its partners. We need this comprehensive plan for ongoing science-based management of our city's forest, and it must be established sooner than later. Thank you very much for your testimony, and please give my regards to my friend <coughs> and uh, former colleague, Dan Goretti. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are we doing today? Pretty good. <laughs> uh, my name is Chris. My first park yeah. tour. Yes. You were oh, there. I feel honored. <laughs> yes. It was great. So my name is Christina Taylor. I'm the executive director for the Friends of Van Cortland Park, and I've been working in the natural areas of Van Cortland since 2000. The Friends is an independent community-based organization which actively promotes the conservation and improvement of Van Cortland Park through environmental education and restoration of the park, of its trails and its forest. The Friends of Van Cortland Park focus the majority of our efforts on the natural areas of the park, and this focus has evolved over time as we realized that the natural areas were not a priority for the city. We do not blame parks for not making the natural areas a priority, as we understand that they have to focus their limited staff and budget on areas such as sporting fields, playgrounds, and the perimeter of the park. However, there is a definite need to make the natural areas more of a priority. Van Cortland Park is the third largest park in New York City with 1,146 acres and approximately half of that park is comp composed of, nat of natural forest, so 500 acres is forest. Unfortunately, the forests of Van Cortland Park are not health very healthy because of the three highways that cut through the park, segmenting and disturbing the forest. According to the master plan for the park, which was released in 2014, at the current rate of expansion without increased management, Norway maples will dominate another 50 acres by 2032, killing the understory and preventing the succession of the native forest. Uh, Norway maples are a non-native invasive species of trees that dominate 130 acres of our forest. In addition, the master plan states that at the current rate of expansion without increased management, 30 acres of forest will be killed by invasive vines by 2032. Both these statements are cause for alarm and need to be addressed. In total, there, throughout the city, there are 7,300 acres of natural forest under the jurisdiction of NYC Parks, which represents a quarter of the agency's holding. Uh, natural forests are important for many reasons, as we all know. They cool the city, they clean our air, they capture stormwater, they provide habitat for wildlife, and they provide a place for New Yorkers to connect to nature. The Friends of Van Cortland Park work closely with NYC Parks and the Natural Areas Conservancy to help maintain the natural areas of our park. We know that there are many other park conservancies, partners, and volunteers that contribute to the management of the forest and the individual parks. However, even with this extra support, New York City natural forests are insufficiently managed due to lack of funding for New York City parks and its partners. So therefore, today we're joining with the Natural Areas Conservancy and, the New, and New Yorkers for Parks and others to ask that the city invest $385 million over the next 25 years for the ongoing management restoration, conservation, and management of our forests, and the city should implement the forest management framework for, the, for New York City that was recently developed by Parks and the Natural Areas Conservancy. The natural areas are at a tipping point. They are threatened by invasive plants, garbage dumping, and lack of management. They need continual investment or they will decline in quality. The forests are at risk of losing diversity that once lost can't be regained. Uh, the Friends of Van Cortland Park are committed to doing what we can to conserve the forest of the park, but we need the city to step up what it is doing because it can't do it alone. Thank you. Well, we appreciate your work and that of your volunteers. And how's that railroad trail coming? <laughs> as far as I know, the construction's going to start early next year, probably. Great, great. Uh, is it Margot? Margot. Margot. You had to add, your parents had to add the T, huh? Just to confuse me. Yeah. They All were, right. They wanted to be French. Okay. Um, <laughs> Ms. Perron, please. Thank you. Um, I am the president of Van Cortland Park Conservancy and the Van Cortland Park Administrator. Um, we, uh, we do support the, uh, the NAC framework. Um, Van Cortland Park Conservancy's mission is to sustain and enhance the park as a vibrant destination for recreation, leisure, and the enjoyment of natural landscapes. We provide educational and cultural programming as well as staffing to enhance the park's forests, fields, and ball fields. Just a subway, bus, or bike ride away from millions of New Yorkers lies a dense, hilly forest containing 100-year-old, 150-year-old trees. 
wildlife recorded on this site include fox, coyote, flying squirrels, owls, salamanders, wild turkey, that's just to name a few. Um, at 140, uh, sorry, 1146 acres, Van Cortlandt is the city's third largest park with an estimated 80,000 trees. Plant and animal diversity here is especially high because it is attached to the mainland with numerous ecological corridors. Henry Hudson and Sawmill Parkways, the Croton Aqueduct, Tibbetts Brook, and the old, Croton, uh, the old Putnam Railroad Line. They all reach like tendrils to the less urban areas to the north. One of the beneficial ecosystem services I'd like to discuss is experience. Hundreds of thousands of high school and college athletes come to Van Cortlandt Park every year to run on its undulating, sylvan, 100-year-old landmark cross-country trail. If you, didn't run on, uh, if you didn't run in this forest, you probably know someone who did. Uh, and Van Cortlandt Park Conservancy maintains the 3.5-mile cross-country trail on a daily basis. Started in 2012, Urban Ecology Teen Internship is a year-round year paid internship program for students from Bronx area public and parochial schools. The program provides local underserved high school students the opportunity to succeed in their first college experience with related college courses while concurrently working in the field alongside the park's natural resource management professionals. On Saturday mornings, NAC, I'm sorry, uh, NYC Audubon experts lead walks for birders of all levels of experience exploring 30 miles of trails that we have. Over 200 species of birds make their homes in Van Cortlandt Park, and we hope that you get to see them all. These are all great experiences to be had in Van Cortlandt Park. There is a growing body of medical research providing quantified evidence of the physical health benefits derived from time spent in the forest. Hiking, sauntering, or even just sitting in the forest, sometimes called forest bathing, provides the following measurable health benefits. Lowering blood pressure, decreased dopamine and adrenaline associated with fight or flight response, diminished negative mood states such as anxiety, fear, depression, decreased rates of asthma, heart disease, stroke, and diabetes, uh, increased blood levels of natural killer cells. These are white blood cells that provide the first order of the immune system, system's rapid response, and increased attention. What's unique to Van Cortlandt Park is that in 2006, when 35 acres of parkland were converted for the construction of a water filtration plant, um, uh, mitigation funding made possible for the creation of the Croton Forest Management Program, including a Van Cortlandt Forest Restoration Crew. This funding from a uh, New York City Department of Environmental Protection provided an invaluable opportunity to create a management plan just for this park uh, and its natural areas. The basis of the plan is a 20-year comparative study, the first of its kind in the nation, that surveyed the entire park to obtain information about how its natural areas have fared since a 1986 study. One positive discovery was that forests had matured and further closed their canopies at the time. Negative trends also became apparent. The acreage covered by invasive vines, such as oriental bittersweet and porcelain berry, and the president, presence and dominance of the invasive Norway maple trees increased throughout the park, and other invasive species as well, such as garlic mustard and myonia. Additional problems, such as soil compaction and degradation, have also worsened. Initial funding for the forest restoration crew was critical uh, for the effort to stem and reverse the trajectory of decline and to document changes. But that funding expired in 2015. Sustainable urban uh, natural areas require a healthy ecology as well as healthy financial support. New sources of support are needed to complete the task of reversing forest decline and for necessary ongoing maintenance into the future. Thank you for this hearing. Thank you. If I could ask uh, Assistant Commissioner Greenfeld to join them for a second because I have a question that I'd like to you to answer, uh, which they two people brought up here. So we have this invasive species of Norway maple, and what do you do about it? What is what is the recommendation from your group that these some of these trees must be massive by now? Uh, I know the Norway maple gets very big, and they are crowding out, you know, native species. So I uh, just wish you could, hope you can educate me on what, what your 
expert opinion might be on that. Right. Um, it's definitely tricky. I knew it was tricky, <laughs> otherwise I wouldn't have asked the question. Uh, no, there's no question Norway maple is not a friend of the forest. It's not just that it's invasive, but it's particularly terrible because it's the first to leaf out in the, the beginning of the season, the last to lose its leaves at the end of the season, so it's completely densely shaded. And you'll see that if it's ever on a hillside, there's erosion underneath it because nothing can grow under it. It's not good. Um, honestly, we take them down when we can and when it's appropriate. We have to follow our tree restitution laws just like anybody else. So um, if we're taking a tree down, we have to plant enough trees to replace the wood that was lost. And, uh, and that's, that's what we have to do. We don't, um, over the course of all the work we do, we don't go in and just take out Norway maples. It would be only in the, in the context of doing a full restoration because you take that out and something else will, will, will yes, grow I, in its I place. Get, so so I, have you thought about this? Because this testimony indicates over 100 acres in, in this. We've definitely thought about it. I okay. did. <laughs> There's no question it's part of our management strategy on a, on a uh, sort of zone by zone process that both uh, Margot's team and our team work on. These trees get very large, though, Norway maples. They do, yeah. I mean, they also, they're quick growing, which means they also fall apart, which that's why we don't plant them anymore. Um, so that means they decline, and so you can take them down if they're also hazardous and unhealthy. Okay. So. I was just curious yeah. about that because that is quite a statistic. So thank you. I'm going to uh, dismiss that panel and call the next one. Thank you all for your testimony and for your work. Uh, Catherine Heinz. Uh, from the New York City Audubon, M.K. Moore. I don't know what this means, but I'm going to say it, N-Y-N-J-T-C. And um, it could mean a lot of things. And Amy Turner from the New York City Climate Action Alliance. Did I get your name right, Ms. Heinz? You did. I did, okay. Thank you. It's not easy being Gredentric. I can't, uh, you know, it's... Well, it if I is. gave you my maiden name, it wouldn't be easy either. <laughs> um, thank you, Council uh, Person Gredentric, uh, for this important hearing. My name is Catherine Heinz. I'm the Executive Director of New York City Audubon. We are a science-based conservation organization whose mission is to protect wild native birds and their habitats across New York City, improving the quality of life for all New Yorkers. We represent 3,000 direct members and supporters. We're an affiliated chapter of National Audubon and as such represent an additional 7,000 of its members residing in the five boroughs and thousands more who follow uh, us and love nature. Wild birds representing more than 350 species, almost a third of all the species in North America, live in or pass through New York City each year. New York City Audubon was founded 40 years ago to protect these birds and the fragile natural, natural areas on which they depend within our city's borders. For the past four decades, we have actively supported the acquisition, conservation, management, and maintenance of forest, often in collaboration with city parks and other government and private not-for-profit stakeholders many of which are represented here today and whose testimony we complement and support. So I'm gonna cut two paragraphs from my presentation. Based on habitat needs for avian species of conservation concern, we strongly support the NAC framework in ensuring short and long-term preservation of city's natural forest. A prominent category of birds that is conspicuous in New York City forests is the neotropical migrant songbirds. The arrival by the millions of these birds in our area beginning each April, peaking in mid-May, is met by bird watchers with eager anticipation. During this period, almost any forested area in the city can be good for observing migrants, but the Ramble in Manhattan Central Park and much of Brooklyn's Prospect Park are renowned world-class birding spots, and they bring tourists. Hundreds of birders show up in these parks with the expectation of seeing 30 to 50 or more species in a single outing. Some of the birds, the parula, the bay-breasted, chestnut-sided, and black-throated green warblers, among others, are exquisite, like colorful tropical fish schooling on a coral reef. 
Many of these birds are en route between their wintering habitat in South American rainforest and the Caribbean to breeding grounds in northern coniferous forest. New York City contains some forests that are large enough and so of sufficient quality that some of the migrants, scarlet tanagers, northern red starts, for example, stay and breed. These include Inwood Hill Park in Manhattan, Alley Pond, Cunningham and Forest Parks in Queens, Pelham Bay, Van Cortland, Riverdale Parks in the Bronx, Wolf's Pond, High Rock, Bloomingdale, and Arden Heights Woods Parks in Staten Island. And I would add the mature growth pockets of uh, older historic cemeteries, Governor's Island and Forts Hamilton, Wadsworth, and Totten all have forested areas. Um, the neotropical migrant migratory songbirds are more than objects of bird watchers' admiration. They constitute an ecological factor of global significance. Warblers and vireos are formidable uh, predators of forest leaf-eating insects. Western hemisphere populations of these birds have been declining. Uh, tropical rainforest destruction is implicated, as is timber cutting in Canada, so these forests in New York City are critical to these birds in their ecological process. Um, and I would add so that New York City forests matter as a matter of global migratory scale. And by conserving, restoring, and managing our forests, we are following the conservation ethos of Act Local, Think Global. But more important, healthy forests are great for birds. Healthy forests are critical for people. And um, the City Council is making here a decision of century implications. Return on investment matters. If you think back 50 years ago, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, Endangered Species Act have made a difference. Ten years ago, the Million Trees Initiative has made a difference. This is a really, really important funding opportunity for the city of New York and for posterity. Thank you. I just want to point out that the mayor has a lot more money than we do. Um, but um, we do, as a council, uh, almost always support additional funding for, for parks. Uh, we might quibble about where it would go, um, but suffice to say that this chair does support um, this initiative. Um, I wonder if you could, Ms. Hines, if you could tell me, have any studies been done on the economic impact of birding on New York City? I don't, it's not something EDC measures, but maybe they do, I don't know. But We've had conversations with um, NYC and company. Um, it hasn't been a focus area. And I don't have an exact study um, on the impacts. I do know that um, the parks are full. And anecdotally, we do uh, zip code catches when we do festivals and birding events around the city. And I would say from Governor's Island and Jamaica Bay in particular, where we do many of these studies, we have people from routinely from the surrounding um, metropolitan area, all five states. We also have people from other regions of the country and across the world who come. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for your testimony. M.K. Moore. I won't ask what, you know, should, maybe I should ask. No, I won't do it. I'm all initials. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, good My afternoon. My initials are B.S. Barry Stevens, so there it. you go. <laughs> <laughs> My name is M.K. Moore. I'm the chairperson for the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference Metro Region. Uh, the Trail Conference oh, actively encourages good. volunteering, preserving, and enjoying the 100-plus miles of forest trails in New York City parks throughout all five boroughs. We have volunteered and participated in New York City Parks Trails events for over 3,800 hours uh, in 2018 alone, and the year's not over. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of the care and maintenance of our forests and the benefit New Yorkers enjoy because of these beautiful forests. I conduct nature hikes in our park forests for students, scouts, organizations, and our neighbors, and volunteers assist in parks maintaining trails, removing invasive species, and educating the community about forests and how they enrich our lives. I've benefited greatly from the research and outreach conducted by the NAC and have attended their presentations throughout the city. Their informed approach to New York City Parks Forest and their long-term plans to ensure our city treasures endure for future generations should be strongly supported. I've included in my written testimony uh, photos taken of our volunteers at work, some nature tours, fun events, and our beautiful forests. Often the children in our nature hikes are experiencing the city forest for the first time, and that experience will stay with them for a very long time. Our city's children and adults should never be deprived of the opportunity to experience and enjoy a beautiful and healthy forest in their own city. The next generation of children should be guaranteed city forests. The health benefits of our forests cannot be fully measured, 
you can only attempt to quantify the long-term benefits of the clean air our citizens breathe, the joy and knowledge they gain, and the peace derived from walking in a, from a busy city street into a healthy and invigorating urban forest. In volunteering, I work closely with the fantastic dead men, uh, men and women of New York City Parks. Without the great work by the New York City Parks employees to help us, train us, and direct us in our volunteering, we would not be able to achieve the results that we do. The knowledge shared by all of the New York City Parks partners, like the NAC, and then disseminated by NYC Parks directly affects the volunteer work that we do. Here today to ask the NYC Council to invest in the forest of NYC Parks so future generations can enjoy the beauty that we all live with today, take the long view towards parks and forests in New York City. Invest today, once this valuable resource is gone, there is no recovery. I think the children and grandchildren of the children that we take into the parks today and into the city forest deserve to take the same hikes. They deserve to appreciate the forest and natural beauty and enjoy the benefits and the same experiences that we do. I think future generations should not have to learn about our city forest at the Museum of Natural History. I ask the uh, New York City Council to commit and invest in a science-based management that will save money and ensure high quality natural spaces for all New Yorkers. And I'd also add this volunteer event November the 3rd in Alley Pond Park. If I, was, uh, I was at the last one. Okay. I think Thank it's on my much. schedule. I was over by um, the Oakland Lake Meadow planting shrubs. They had planted the trees by the time. It was wet that day, but there were a lot of people. It was about 20 people there, so it was, it was good. And uh, I look forward to being with you again. I'm supposed to plant on in Cunningham Park on Saturday morning, but Mother Nature may have another idea. So we'll see. Um, Ms. Turner? Good afternoon. My name is Amy Turner. I'm the executive director of the NYC Climate Action Alliance, a growing coalition of New Yorkers who are committed to helping New York City achieve its goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions 80% by 2050. Thank you to Chair Gredenchik and to the city council members who attended today for the opportunity to participate in this important public hearing and to the Natural Areas Conservancy and the Parks Department for their crucial work in this area. I'm here today to express my organization's support for the implementations of all recommendations set forth in the Forest Management Framework for New York City, released by NAC and the Parks Department in April. New York City's forested areas are hugely important in mitigating the impacts of climate change. We know that the world is warming, with 17 of the 18 hottest years on record having occurred since 2001. New York City, with its susceptibility to urban heat island effect, will continue to see record high temperatures during the summer. This puts at risk the health and lives of already vulnerable populations. A robust tree canopy is one of the most effective ways to mitigate the urban heat island effect, with data showing that urban forested areas can lower the surrounding air temperature by up to nine degrees, helping protect New Yorkers from the dangerous and potentially fatal impacts of extremely hot temperatures. In addition, the changing climate merely ensures that we will continue to experience stronger, wetter, and more devastating storms than were previously seen in New York City. Urban planted and forested areas can capture millions of gallons of stormwater each year, filtering pollutants and minimizing the impact on our water treatment system when current infrastructure is overwhelmed by intense storm events. Furthermore, live trees and plants sequester carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. The 7,300 areas of forested natural areas in New York City parks have the potential to sequester hundreds of thousands of tons of carbon dioxide each year. Maintaining them is crucial to offsetting some of the carbon dioxide released each year and to mitigating the impacts of climate change. On the other hand, disturbance of these natural areas uh, from neglect or failure to maintain a healthy forest ecosystem would cause the release of large amounts of carbon dioxide that are, is currently stored in the forests, trees, and plants, further exacerbating the effects of climate change. While New York City's trees can help to protect New Yorkers from the impacts of climate change, I must also note that they are suffering from, ex from the extreme temperatures and changing weather conditions as well. The recommendations in the forest management framework include integrating climate adapted planting pallets into forested areas. Given the many benefits to New Yorkers of urban forested areas, not only those related to climate change, but the many, other, the many others that have been highlighted today, the city should take all necessary steps needed to protect urban forested areas from the impacts of climate change. New York City has set laudable goals to reduce the city's greenhouse gas emissions 80% by 2050, to do its part to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius over pre-industrial levels, 
and to grow and develop the city in a way that is resilient and equitable. The role of urban forested areas in achieving each of these goals cannot be overstated. Protecting them is crucial to mitigating climate change and adapting New York City in the face of continu continuing impacts. The recommendations set forth in the forest management framework, including those to protect urban forests from the impacts of climate change, should be implemented in their to totality. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here today, and uh, thank you for your appreciation and your support of our urban forests. Uh, thank you. I think we have one more panel. If anybody else would like to testify, you had cold feet before, anything like that, and you change your mind, please uh, come forward. Um, you're not going to believe this, but we have a Mr. Todd Forrest <laughs> here to testify today from the New York Botanical Garden. Uh, Natasha Siddhartha from the Gowanus Canal Conservancy. Donald um, Reckleys, Reckleys, I'm sorry, uh, from Brooklyn. And Adam Martinek from the Inwood Hill Park Conservancy. He's also with the NAC and also New Yorkers for Parks. So um, if you could come forward. Mr. Forrest. Good afternoon. My name is Todd Forrest, Arthur Ross Vice President for Horticultural and Urban Forestry at the New York Botanical Garden. I would like to thank the Chair and the Committee for giving me the opportunity to offer testimony today. The Garden serves parks and natural areas and services that help to preserve New York City and Bronx and the United States. The New York Botanical Garden is a conservation garden that oh, yeah. in New York City that can help to Is your microphone on? Is the little That's better. Okay. okay. Oh, better. Thank you. Uh, the New York Botanical Garden is a conservation organization and museum of plants with a three-part mission of science, education, and horticulture. The garden's location in the Bronx was chosen primarily for its 50-acre old-growth forest, the largest remnant of old-growth forest in New York City. The garden has strived to be the best possible steward of this extraordinary natural landscape since the late 19th century. Today, the Thane Family Forest is an outdoor laboratory where scientists study the impacts of environmental change on forested ecosystems a living classroom where students of all ages come to learn about forest ecology and ecological restoration, and an oasis for countless New Yorkers who crave a quiet and wholesome connection to nature. The garden's long commitment to documenting and preserving local biodiversity began with the first inventory of the flora of the forest in the late 1890s and continues today with many collaborative and outward-looking projects. Since 2007, we have engaged citizen scientists in regular phenology walks in the forest in an effort to establish a baseline against which we can compare the impacts of climate change on our native flora. The forest served as the training and pilot location for NYBG's New York City Ecoflora Project, a collaboration among NYBG botanists, colleagues and sister institutions and government agencies, including Parks and the NAC, and citizen scientists to document the complex relationships between New York's plants, and the vast array of birds, insects, and other living things that depend on them for their survival. The garden's forest is not just a haven for wild plants, birds, mammals, and insects. It has become an invaluable outdoor classroom where New York City school children learn about science and discover the joys of nature. Each year, more than 18,000 students, predominantly from public schools in the Bronx, and more, 1, 000, and more than 1,800 New York City teachers use the forest for everything from self-guided ecology tours to in-depth curriculum-driven programs. Students participate in several citizen scientist activities, including water quality monitoring, surveys of emerging invasive species, and recording plant phenology. Regional high school and university students have partnered with NYBG staff to use the forest and other natural landscapes at the garden for more in-depth ecological studies on subjects ranging from the assessments of snapping turtle and breeding bird populations, to the monitoring of forest canopy gaps and soil seed banks. We know from our own research, from the scientific literature, and from our own personal experience that even the smallest remnant forest in New York City is an oxygen producing, storm water filtering, wildlife sustaining, soul lifting miracle that should be protected, restored, and celebrated. Therefore, the New York Botanical Garden wholeheartedly endorses parks and the Natural Area Conservancy in their efforts to secure the resources required for the short and long-term preservation of natural forests in New York City. 
Thanks again for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for being here today. I haven't been to the Botanical Garden since I became chair, but it is on the short list. We should get, I will, get there soon. I will, well, maybe in the spring. Oh. Although you do have a great railroad, uh, model railroad in the exhibit every year, so. It opens the third week in November. Okay. You're always welcome. Okay. Um, Ms. Siddhartha? I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Yes, Siddhartha. Okay, close enough for government work? Okay, <laughs> go ahead. Um, thank you for letting me testify today. Um, my name is Natasia Siddhartha. Um, I'm representing the Gowanus Canal Conservancy, which is in Gowanus, Brooklyn. Um, Gowanus Canal Conservancy advocates for and stewards ecologically sustainable parks and public spaces in the Gowanus lowlands by engaging those who live, work, and play there. We envision a Gowanus Canal and surrounding environment that is clean, resilient, diverse, and alive. Since 2006, we have served as the environmental steward for the neighborhood through leading grassroots volunteer projects, educating students on environmental issues, and working with agencies, elected officials, and the community to advocate for, build, and maintain innovative green infrastructure around the Gowanus Canal. We're also a participant of New York City Nature Goals, of which we support their overarching goal of increased equity and access to nature in New York City. The Gowanus Canal and surrounding lowland neighborhoods have endured over a century of environmental injustices, um, including industrial dumping, sewage overflows, and heat island impacts. Urban forests, specifically street trees, are an essential component of the emerging network of equitable and resilient parks and public spaces in the Gowanus lowlands. Through restitution plantings and neighborhood development, we anticipate about 800 new street tree plantings in Gowanus over the next five years. These young trees have the capacity to provide critical ecosystem services, um, which have been mentioned today, um, from stormwater management to habitat corridor to increase shade and cooling. However, they will only reach this capacity if they're cared for along the way. Um, everyday actions, including watering, weeding, aerating the soil, pruning, are just as important to tree survival as the one-time action of planting. Um, as volunteer program manager for Gowanus Canal Conservancy, I have firsthand experience in how much care those young street trees need. Um, over the past 10 years, we've worked with New York City Parks Department to inventory our trees, draft a tree management plan that identifies challenges and strategies for caring for our growing urban forest. And every year we engage 110 volunteers in caring for those trees. Um, thanks in part to City Council's Parks Equity Funding and Greener New York City initiatives, um, we've grown the stewardship into um, two main programs that support long-term engagement through the neighborhood. Um, our Gowanus Tree Network, for one, is made up of neighbors working together to build a network of tree stewards on their blocks. Just in 2018, two of those blocks actually placed in Greenest Block in Brooklyn through the Brooklyn Botanic Garden competition. Um, and neighbors came together over a shared goal of caring for the valuable open space on their blocks. On the job training side, our Gowanus Green Team high school apprentices became licenses and pruners, and they learned about environmental careers in green infrastructure, urban conservation and design, um, building the next generation of engaged environmental leaders. We're committed to working closely with the Parks Department to care for the Gowanus urban forest by cultivating those, that community stewardship of street trees but our maintenance capacity will be challenged by the sheer number of new trees planted at once. In neighborhoods across the city, the Parks Department needs more funding to provide direct maintenance and to support conservancies like ours that amplify the agency's efforts through stewardship. And one more paragraph. As the effects of climate change worsen, um, as Nini has mentioned before, there is more need than ever to invest in natural areas. Urban forests mitigate extreme heat, absorb greenhouse gases, and are an effective form of green infrastructure, reducing flooding and sewage overflow. As the Gowanus Canal specifically undergoes a comprehensive cleanup, there's a tremendous opportunity to restore natural areas along the shoreline, which can buffer storm surge and reduce flooding. And um, ultimately, the city needs to invest now in the ongoing restoration, conservation, and management of our forests and natural areas in order to protect and grow a vibrant city for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Reckless, I hope I, I'm sorry. I, some names just are beyond me. I answer to just about anything. <laughs> okay, that's good. <laughs> uh, first of all, let me thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, testify here today. Uh, I am a vice president of Protectors of Pine Oak Woods. That's a land conservation organization on Staten Island. I mentioned that uh, 
because I'm very familiar with the parks and natural areas in that place. Uh, I am, however, testifying about my own viewpoints and not for the organization because uh, I got notice of this meeting only last night and uh, was not able to involve them. Uh, as a Brooklyn resident, I've hiked and ambled through those areas for more than 15 years. For 12 years, I've been a trail maintainer there. I've been involved in the monthly restoration activity there for uh, over 12 years. Uh, that activity is mostly removing alien wooding woody twining vines from uh, the woodlands there. Uh, during that time, I've noticed considerable improvement in those natural areas, especially in the cleanliness of the trails and the attempts to reforest abused areas. But at the same time, it is obvious that invasive species overall have not been checked despite a variety of attempts to do so. Uh, in my own mind, I don't believe that the invasion of these species can be halted, but I do believe that we can and must make the attempt if we are to preserve any variety in the number of native plants that still exist in our woodlands. On Staten Island, my first impression was that the alien vines strangling the trucks and sapping, saplings were one of the largest problems, but then I observed the invasion of white-tailed deer, uh, the growth of an Japanese angelica trees, then I became alarmed at Japanese stiltgrass spreading along the trails, suppressing the native growth, becoming a meadow-like uh, monoculture. All serious problems. I will not uh, speak about the deer because it will take up all of the remaining time that I have. I urge that more volunteers be continue to be recruited and trained to remove invasive plants from the woodlands. The park steward program should be, if possible, should be, if possible, emphasized and expanded. My opinion is if we did this many years ago, such plants as Japanese stiltgrass and Japanese angelica trees that are now out of control would have been halted. I suggest that commercial landscapers could be employed to work more generally on controlling invasive plants, not just on specific projects. That trained workers, I emphasize trained, could range the woodlands year-round, employing spot treatment of herbicides in the spring and fall, cutting or pulling Japanese stiltgrass and mile a minute vine in the summer, and cutting and uprooting twining trees in the winter. I also urge that special attention be paid to recognizing and eliminating, eliminating emerging invasive species before they become an established and expensive problem, as have oriental bittersweet, etc. And as regarding the established invasive plants, I urge that attempts to control them especially focus on eliminating new found infestations and existing infestations that are small and perhaps likely to expand. And I thank the committee for soliciting my comments. And thank you very much for your uh, many years of wisdom on this. Um, the last person to testify today, Adam, what's your name? From the Inwood Hill Park Conservancy. He's got a lot of, he wears a lot of hats. Yeah. Um, uh, I just wanted to thank you, Chairman um, and Council Members, for letting me speak here today. Um, my name is Adam Martinek. I'm a resident of Inwood Hill Park um, in North Manhattan. Uh, I'm an activist and a founder of Inwood Hill Park Conservancy, a group that works with scientists to tackle local issues such as uh, sorry, um, anthropogenic um, in activity caused by human presence, um, dog presence, um, in addition to the fundamental issues which are impacting Inwood Hill Park, which is um, compaction, soil acidification, and erosion attributed to invasive species. Um, I'm here to testify in support of the forest management framework for NYC, um, developed by the Natural Areas Conservancy and NYC Parks, which I believe will begin to lay an important foundation in response to several decades of insufficient funding for natural forests. Um, I would like to take a few moments to highlight some of the innumerable benefits uh, natural forests bestow upon park goers, as well as the impact a well-funded, robust forest management plan will have on the longevity of New York City. Um, trees play a vital role in keeping our city cool. Natural forests reduce urban heat island effect, absorbing much of the heat emitted by asphalt and other dark flat surfaces that permeate heat within the city. A single hanging branch over a sidewalk can um, reduce summer heat temperatures by up to 33 to 41 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, between 2007 and 2015, um, 
NYC Parks partner with NYRP, organizing 50,000 people, volunteers, um, to plant nearly 500,000 trees. Um, this amazing feat of botanical engineering allowed us uh, dozens of parks um, and sidewalks to feel cool and lower the general heating effects of the city by nine degrees. Um, natural forests have statistically been proven to improve the immune system, um, reduce stress, accelerate the rate of recovery from surgery and illness, increase energy, and generally improve a person's mood. Um, Shinryu Hoku is the forest bathing method prescribed by Japanese in 1982. It is the most cost-effective drug-free method to improve health. Um, New York City is home to 600 species that live within our urban wilderness, according to Commissioner Silver. Um, natural forests are comprised of a complex ecological niche communities that provide a refuge to migratory fowl, owls, raccoons, and possum. Um, in areas such as Pelham Bay Park, Van Cortlandt Park, and Inwood Hill Park, um, home to some of the largest contiguous natural forests in the city, white-tailed deer, coyotes, and bald eagles can be found. Um, natural forests make excellent classrooms. Children, young adults, and enthusiasts benefit from guided tours that inform on the ecosystems of a given park. Identifying species allows for observers to gain an empirical experience into what makes a forest so special. Moreover, educating children and young adults within, and within nature provides the best insurance against vandalism and pollution in the future. It is difficult to harm something you've come to understand and respect. New York City Parks Division of Forestry, Horticultural, and Natural Resources has managed 7,300 acres of forest within the city park system for over 25 years. It has done amazing work to preserve and protect our cityscape. Um, what the city needs now is a restoration plan that addresses um, uh, the long-term effects um, under its care while providing funding that ensures 5 million plus trees will be well managed into the city's future. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for your testimony. Um, there are no other people here to testify today. And um, I think I've asked enough questions, so I am going to end the hearing. But uh, before I do, I want to thank all of you who uh, came today, those of you who are still here, and those of you who uh, could not stay till the end of the hearing. Um, based on what we've heard, it is uh, quite obvious to me at least that, um, and the testimony that we've heard, uh, that our forests are both beloved and that they need to be cared for uh, by the residents of New York City. Um, securing the funds that we need uh, will not be easy, uh, but given the passion and the number of people represented by the organizations that have testified today, um, it is certainly doable, especially over a long period of time. And uh, I, as chair of parks, uh, am committed to raising the overall budget for the parks department. It certainly would include funding um, for our natural forest areas as well. So uh, I end um, asking that uh, as we go forward over the next few months, and if your organization or yourself or both are called upon uh, to help us in whatever activities, uh, all legal, I can assure you, uh, lobbying on this, uh, your local council members, uh, appearing on the steps of City Hall for rallies, and all those things that we do um, uh, to raise money for our uh, each individual. See, Ms. Greenfeld works for the city, as do I, but uh, she works for the mayor, and I don't. So uh, that's all good. Um, the mayor has been very good to our parklands. We have uh, increased funding for parks uh, greatly percentage-wise and in actual dollars uh, since he has become mayor. Uh, and there is a, currently about $4.6 billion in the pipeline um, in capital uh, work for the city uh, park parklands. Um, but we do need, I think, and I've had several discussions, I'm going to continue to have them, and hopefully we will grow this, um, that we need more of a constituency. We know that New Yorkers love our parks, and so we're going we're gonna to start and we're going to expand. And so if your organization is called upon to come to a meeting or to come to a rally or make those phone calls or send those postcards, uh, we hope that you will join with me and my colleagues here and like-minded New Yorkers. Uh, it is obvious from the amount of money donated to the conservancies that are in place in the city, uh, there are 17 that 
raise over a million raise and spend over a million dollars a year in addition and, and Central Park is closing in on a hundred million dollars a year these numbers are massive and uh, they're all to the good um, it shows that New Yorkers care um, about their parks and if somebody donates a million dollars it's not like they get to use the park by themselves so it's really a very selfless act so uh, with that um, I am going to close this hearing again. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, thank you, com Assistant Commissioner. I call you Commissioner because you know what, what's what's. We'll just take away the assistant. Just don't tell <laughs> Commissioner Silver I did that. Um, there's Liam, our first Deputy Commissioner, uh, an outstanding, um, truly a treasure to all New Yorkers. He has been for how many years is it now, Commissioner? Too many to count. Too many to count. <laughs> So uh, with that, I'm going to close the hearing, and I thank you again for being here. If you'd like to follow up with me or with Chris Sartori or Monica, our, uh, our new, she's got all the money. She's the finance assistant. <laughs> You're in the corner. That's your first mistake. Um, <laughs> I thank you all again, and I'm going to put this on my desk, and um, we're going to go forward from this day. Thank you all.